These are the good things that good halves do, is you play what you see in front of you. Your first idea is to kick the ball into the corner, because that's what you want to do. But if no one's coming up, you just take the metres and 100%. kick the ball. There's an element here. The front rowers, because they don't come up with it enough, yeah. I don't think they practice it enough. So when they get in those situations, they can't execute it with the confidence necessary. Yes, kia ora whanau. Welcome back to another episode. And thanks for watching, everyone. Firstly, Ethram, Dills, Willie, welcome back, brother. It's good to see you all, guys. Hi, bro. What's happening? Hello. Weekend, Hi, how's the weekend? Uh, good, good. I came to the Warriors game uh, and saw you from the sidelines. You, you were Beautiful. looking good on that Sky broadcast as always, man. Thank you, bro. Hey, and just for everyone tuning in, there is chapter markers. We did say that last week. So you can skip to wherever you want to go to watch what's on this episode. Also, keep liking, keep subscribing, and tell all your whānau and friends, come and tune into this beautiful game of rugby league and us having this mean as cordial. Anyways, Ethram, what's coming up on the show? Well, we've got a big, big news week. A lot of uh, contract stuff, uh, uh, local stuff in Australia, which we'll get into. But first, we need to start with, obviously, the biggest news, mm. which is, of course, Origin Teams. Uh, Queensland yet to come out. Maybe we'll come out while we're recording. But New South, we've got it in the bag now, what the team is looking like for game two. Uh, Dylan Edwards in, Latrell in, all the boys, Cam Murray's back. Uh, what do you guys think of the game two blues side? Yeah, what a squad. Uh, most probably their, their strongest team named, I think, besides obviously the guys that are missing from there. Um, you'll be happy, uh, a Blues supporter, I'm, I'm saying up the Blues, just to make it a little bit more interesting, <laughs> eh? Go back up to up to Suncorp and um, play up there for the, the final, be nice. I think the big surprise for me is Connor Watson. I think, um, you know, Cameron McInnes sitting at 90th man, I thought he did a good enough job uh, in their in their last State of Origin game, and I think if you look through their, their team, it's, it's quite strong. Mitch Barnett, I'm liking him getting a little bit closer. There may be another opportunity. I think um, you know what he's done, and we said it all along that he's he's been enormous uh, for the Warriors, and he plays with his heart on his sleeve, and he's tough and he's strong. But yeah, I think their squad is, is strong, and it's going to be a competitive one against the the Queenslanders for sure. Yeah, it's a more Origin looking team, if you know what I mean. It's a more yeah. hard and more experienced side. I I, I just don't think uh, Tedesco did enough to mm. convince the selectors to say, "Hey, this is my jersey." You know, and, and keep uh, Dylan Edwards at bay. Dylan Edwards obviously played on the weekend, made his comeback and did enough in that and obviously did enough in the lead-up to Origin 1 to get the initial selection. So he gets his jumper back. Uh, Latrell been yeah. on fire the last couple of weeks. Um, automatic, even though uh, Bradman Best was very, very good yesterday yep. for the Knights and, and pushed him mm. as far as giving himself a chance. Uh, Latrell deserves to be there and he, he's a real dangerous threat to the Queenslanders, and I'm a little bit different to Blairy, where, uh, yeah, I'll take 2-0 this, this time around. I don't care what they pull out. I'll, just want, I'll, go, I'll take the sweep if it comes for Queensland, but it makes it exciting yeah. if, with this side. It makes it competitive. Obviously, Queensland have struggled in Melbourne. Um, New South Wales have had a lot of joy down there, so history is on their side as far as playing down there and you know, could take it to a decider in Brisbane in, in about four or five weeks' time. So... That'll be exciting for everybody, but as a Queensland fan and being selfish for Queensland, I'd, I'll take the win and take the 2-0 and, and the victory in the series straight up. But yeah, I thought Cam McInnes was good uh, game one. He toiled, he works hard, mm, yeah. but they need a point of difference. And that's where Cam Murray oh, comes yeah. in. He's a bit more of a ball player. He's got that threat through the line, pre-line, post-line. He'll come up with some shots mm. and a bit more of a threat there. And So... I, I, I do. I'll go back to what I said at the start. I think it's a really strong-looking origin team for New South Wales this time round. Yeah, I like, like I like Cameron Murray. He's he's a tough player, um, and he's made for origin. I think every time he's played in origin, I've I've been disappointed that they've played him in the back row rather than his middle position. I think he's a really good lock. Um, the way he ball plays, but he's tough. He takes the ball to the line. He can get get quick play the balls as well, and, and Reese Robson can run on the back. Obviously, having Mitch Moses back in the team with this kicking game um, is important, and the way that Jerome Luai has been playing the last I don't know, six weeks without um, Cleary in the team, he's been enormous. He's had his hands over everything. So a lot of those guys are coming in there in form. Uh, Latrell Mitchell and those centres, wow, they are, they are elite, those two centres, and 
um, you know, the Queenslanders are going to have their um, hands tight full. Yeah, just a big one, just before we go off that, is uh, Connor Watson. Mm. Uh, Connor Watson's a big, big selection, a big gamble for me. But he's, he's got utility value. And I suppose that's what they're, they're picking him for in that 14 spot is he can cover a multitude of, of positions on the field. They learnt last time that they needed that utility value and missed out when Swaliti went off. So that's probably a big tick in his box. We'll see how he goes and how he can handle the step up. Well, that's what I was going to ask because one of the casualties for the team was actually Matt Burden is not in the 20 yeah. at all. Like, So he didn't play in game one at all. He was 18th man and he has now been dropped. Is it anything to do with perhaps Connor Watson? Is is that a type of utility player? Maybe they're like, oh, because that's always Burden's biggest thing. He can play centre, he can play six. Yeah, well, I don't know where, what else I think Connor Watson can sit around the middle of the park. And I think, I guess, when you watch Connor Watson play, I guess it's the leg speed over the ad line. I think that's where he can make a difference. If you jump on the back of someone like a Homoli or Spencer, then you've got a Colin Watson with his feet around there, which helps obviously, you know, Yo, which helps Cameron Murray, which helps Reeb Robson. So I think the difference for me would be around the middle of the park, and this is where they're going to have to make a difference, where they're going to be able to play a little bit of shape, but also get over the ad line and make the Queensland middles have to work really hard. But I think, you know, he's hard done by Matt Burden. I think he hasn't done anything wrong. Um, you know, he can play in the halves, he can play in the centres, but they've got some quality in their halves at the moment, and they're playing really well. Yeah, I think Matt Burton's a back utility. Mm. He can cover almost every yeah. position in the back line, whereas Connor Watson is a forward utility worth some half value. Yeah. If they need someone to fill in the halves, he can jump in there. If somebody goes down, say your Moses or your Luwais, he can probably fill in there and do a job of helping out. He won't be the standout half if he's in there, but he can fill in and do a, do a job defending, especially on that edge for them. But... Yeah, that's probably where he gets the jump on Matt Burton. And he's got that forward and a little bit of back value, whereas Burton's an out-and-out back coverage from full-back wing all the way in. Last one for the Blues team. Uh, you just said his name there. Mitch Moses has obviously uh, seceded from Nico Hines. Uh, pretty tough week for Nico. He, I mean, he missed that kick against my favourite team, the Dolphins, in their game, which we'll get to later on. And then, obviously, uh, they've decided to go with Moses for game two. Deserved for Moses to get into this team? Yeah, well, I think they've gone back to their first choice that they would have picked Moses at yeah. the start. And, yeah, I just don't think Nico Hines has been up to it. And I know he's been chucked in some tough situations, you know what I mean? Like on, on that first game, they were down, you know, man out, gone. And he had to defend in some places that he didn't want to. The previous game that he played, he was in the centres, come on. Hasn't really been able to able to play in the position as he liked, but he did in the last one. And I think what he could have done better was just look after his role as a seven and what he could do as a dominant, dominating seven and put them in a nice position. But he didn't do that good enough or well enough for origin for the origin level. And I think, like like I said earlier, it's Miss Moses' kicking game that can either be a, a long kick from back in their own half, which is which is key and vital to the origins, uh, origin matches, is that you've got a good kicker that can get you out of trouble just with their kick. So I think that's where he comes in. He's also play, He's tough. He plays fast. He plays down short sides. He challenges you everywhere on the field. So, yeah, very unlucky for, for Nico not to be in there again. But I just think, you know, he just wasn't up to the standard that they needed to at, at origin level for New South Wales. Yeah, what they missed out of Nico Hines as far as the kicking and, and taking defenders on and, and having a run game as well as a spot-on passing game, reading the threats, that's what Mitchell Moses has done since he's come back. You know, he's elevated Parramatta again to being a threat because of his presence and because of his play. And because of all that, he's got the jump on him. There's a couple of people that may have been in the conversation. And, um, if Adam Reynolds was fit and playing well, would he have been in the conversation? Possibly. Uh, a lot of people talking about Cody Walker and how he's been playing yeah. and playing in the seven jersey with Jack White at Souths and the turnaround in the last couple of weeks. He's really stood up to be counted. His, kick, his short kicking game, his run threat's been dangerous again. So he could have pushed him, but now that uh, Moses has got the jersey and they've got to rely on him, put all their faith in him, and I'm sure he'll do a really good job. As I said, he's another one who's origin ready. He's been there before. He'll be uh, calling upon that experience and be good for it. So the Queensland squad isn't announced quite yet, but 
there's been some reports coming out about it, uh, namely that Selwyn Cobo and Jermaine Hopgood are most likely not going to be in the team with uh, Kalfusi and Capewell being the people to take their place in the 17. Hopgood obviously has his injury with his back that uh, he would miss the game for the Eels. But Cobo, I'm not actually sure if he's injured or if it's tactical or something like that. Uh, but yeah, we shall see. Do you guys have any thoughts on what that would mean, if that's true? Yeah, well, I think if, you know, if Billy went with Cobo in the first first origin game, he'll go with him again. But if he's injured, then there's some cloud around him. So I guess the most important thing when you're picking origin sides is that they're, they're game and fit ready on day one, not um, going into with clouds over their heads or injuries or carrying a, a nickel because, you know, you can't afford to be t- time on the sidelines while you're training, where you're trying to build momentum, where you've got a big game coming up that you want to win so you can clean sweep them. So I think it's most probably a niggle, niggling injury. Um, and Hopgood, I think he's got a lower back problem. Um, so again, I think Kafusi comes in there. I thought he did really well. He'd come off the bench and he's been playing pretty solid for, for the Dolphins as well, up the middle of the park, um, being nice and strong. He's played at that level before, defensively sound. Uh, Kirk Catewell was a bit of a surprise for me. Um, you know, I think he's been in and out of injury at, at the Warriors, haven't had much consistency in performances, but he's played at that origin level before and knows how to get it done. He did play in the centres one year, there for, for Queensland and can cover through the middle of the park as a, as a middle, as an edge, and, and has played in the centres before. So, um, yeah, he's most probably why he's mostly been mentioned to be a part of that Queensland team. Yeah, it's very rare that you change your winning side in origin. So it'd be a real surprise if it is a tactical one. And totally get it if it's uh, injury-forced mm. that Billy Slate has had to make this change. And if it is so, then I'd understand why Caprell has won because he's played in the centres, played a whole series in the centres where they won the series under Wayne Bennett and did a really good job. Mm. So he's earned that trust and that faith in having done it before. Um, he's played as a back rower by trade, so he can cover both positions and probably does it a little bit better if you, you're scoring both him and Cobo because Combo's not really played back row at NRL level, let alone origin level. So he probably gets the run on top of him, but yeah, he's just been out of out of form this year. He's not really hit the heights that people would have liked coming to the Warriors. He's had injuries throughout, so he hasn't had a consistent run of games. So it is a bit of a gamble on that respect too. But yeah, as you said, we're still waiting for the final team to come out. That's a rumour that's going around mm. right now. By the time this goes to air, we'll have the team and hopefully uh, we know for sure by the end of this uh, this filming. Well, do you know if it's, a, if it's a tactical change for Cobb and he's not injured, right? Do you think that because it's a tactical one, the refs are going to be on high alert? Billy's thinking, all right, we had Reese uh, Walsh get knocked out at the, that he's thinking we might be okay in that space because the refs are going to be on edge around that, that contact and... You know, well, I that's guess, a gamble, isn't it? That's yeah. a gamble, and that's a gamble you take. It's and that's very rare that we said this before Origin One that it's a gamble that uh, that they went with Como on the bench to start with. Having a back is very rare that you do that. But yeah, which, either way, it's a gamble. And Billy, if he's going that way, is hoping uh, for more than anything. I'll drop it back to you. I hate to interrupt. Yo, look at this. <laughs> there we go. Out. Look at this. Um, so I'll read off the team. Uh, yeah. For. Dramatic effect. Wow. Uh, Reese Walsh, Xavier Coates, Val Holmes, Hammer, Murray Taolungi, Tom Dead, and Cherry Evans, all the same. Cotter, Ben Hunt, Collins, Sua Nanai, Carrigan, all the same. And then the bench Harry Grant, Mo Fotueka, Felice Kalfusi, Kurt Capewell, and Dane Gagai He's as back. 18th man. He's oh. back. Ooh, wee. Yeah. Helam Luki, 19. Nice. And Trent Liero at yeah. 20. Oh, I think, man, what a, what a squad. And yeah. Kurt Kate, well, <coughs> I guess it just solidifies like tidying up that, that middle of the park or having someone that can cover the middle of the park. Um, I guess that's where Dan Gagai comes in, eh? If there's a if there's a grade one, a grade one, he slips straight into it. So you don't have to actually have him in the team. So he's covered his, his bases by putting another extra middle on the on the bench. If there is a grade one HIA, Dan Gago automatically gets activated and straight in there. So He's done it a different way this time, but kind of a similar way uh, where that if someone does go off for grade one HIA, then you've got a centre coming in if it's an outside back. So he's got cover 
all over the field. I like it. I think, yeah, like I think we just mentioned about Kirk Catewell hasn't played consistently, but at that level has been quality, a quality player. Strong, strong team list, I think, you know. Trent Lero, rewards to him. Mm -hmm. uh, be playing really well down at the Melbourne Storm, being tough, being strong. Come out a great system. I think this is where Billy Slater obviously understands the defensive mindset that the Storm have, that he puts trust in the guys down there, that they they do the same thing as what he's asking at, at Queensland level. Helam Lukey, a nice young kid that's coming through uh, well up in the... Um, the Cowboys, I think, uh, before he got injured, one of the, the, the rising stars in the back rows, I think he's got some speed, he's got some great talent, he's strong, he carries the ball well, so he's one step closer to Mitchell Lear dream of it. So what a, what another strong team, a competitive team going up against a, a strong blue side. I like it. Yeah, it'll be a great one. I think the fact that uh, Cobbo isn't included on the reserves as well, I think that indicates it's an injury one. Yeah. It's got to be something like that for him to be as good as he was in Origin 1 and not be included in the in the 20-man squad. It must be an injury force change on Billy Slatter. So, yeah, well done to Kirk Capewell for making his comeback. But I, I've been saying for a while now that I'd love to see Dane Gagai mm. back in there for what he's done for Queensland and the service he's given, the consistency that he's always played with. He's never let them down when he's played. So he's back in there. He's... He's in with a shout of getting a game. If this is the team that goes with it, and he's 18th man, then he could be back in the game if there is an, an HIA, HIA category one. Yeah. Reese Walsh comes back. It's yeah. only been a couple of weeks, but I'm sure he'll be threatening and dangerous again. But, yeah, that, that's a squad that uh, knows each other now. Mm. After having one one campaign, one, one game together, one week, they go again. They get to go themselves in camp. Uh, full congratulations to Helam Lukey. Great kid. Got the opportunity to work with him last year in the Samoa camp. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic young man um, who's worked hard, had his injury problems throughout, but getting his games now, working really hard to get there. So to him and Trent Liero, real, real mm. massive congratulations for getting this and we'll see if they get a game. Yeah, sweet. So this is now exciting. Uh, yeah. What, what, are you? <laughs> what, do you, what do you reckon? Uh, I mean, <laughs> man, Gaga is – I love to see that, man. I love Gaga. He's a he's – a, Great plays, and it's cool to see him back with maybe the chance to even get on the field. But yeah, yeah. That, that, I reckon that's the tactical change that he's made. I think you know, obviously, it's his hands must be forced with, forced with Cobo being uh, having a niggling injury. But like we both said, he, he's a chance of playing if something happens. And a smart by Billy putting a centre or an outside back that can cover those everywhere from winger centre to fullback. Yeah. Um, at that ending to man, yeah. so another smart you know change from Billy and he's he's a bit of a mastermind and a student of the game and knows what he's doing doesn't he Billy we trust yeah <laughs> that's goal so next week we'll do uh, obviously a pre-match on our next week's show uh, but for now all we have to do is get excited for Origin 2 when the Blues win oh yo <laughs> right guys uh, anyway moving on <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to some contract chat because there's a lot of uh, contractual things that's happening all across the NRL at the moment. Um, we'll start off with David Armstrong who performed a backflip, a big backflip mm. on uh, what was happening. So it looked like the Roosters were in for him. They wanted to get him. He said no. The Knights then signed him on a two-year extension until... Uh, the end of 2026 and within a matter of days after that his management came up and said no nah, we don't want that uh can we get a release now and he's uh, set to move now to the lee leopards under adrian lamb in the super league yeah which i mean man how does <laughs> how does that even happen well yeah again similar to um for feeder you have a 10-day cooling down period uh when you say uh, but but uh, the, he's signed. I believe. Pen to paper, or uh, oh. similar to what yeah. David said. Yes, I'm coming yeah. down. But no, I think I think it most probably was more of a yes. I want to sign. I don't think there's a pen to paper. That's just me. You know what I mean? Um, well, and this these are the things that can happen. I think other options come around, and people offer you better money or a better opportunity. Um, Willie would talk more about the Lee, Lee Leopards because I don't know too much about the, the, the Super League or what's going on over there. But um, if it is, it's a great signing. I watched uh, some of his game, his highlights over the weekend, playing in, in New South Wales Cup and scored some great tries down there. I think it was nearly a full-length field try. Um, 
he's a great talent of a player. I think you know his his first four games he played at Newcastle, he didn't skip a beat. Um, he, you know, everyone was wondering what's going to happen with Caelan Ponga out, and they've found a couple of two two young fullbacks that have just come in and just got the job done for. Oh, well, been been playing well in those positions. So yeah, um, whatever happens here, um, I think he's going for a better opportunity. Yeah, I'd, I'd go back to some of the David Feeder stuff and some of the stuff we've spoken about on the show before. I'm a bit old school. When you put your hand out and you agree to something, that's your word is your bond and you've got to honour that. Now, regardless of what happens, you're given time to think about your contract and negotiate all those sorts of things. So when you put pen to paper or you shake hands, as a man, that's your agreement. You know, and to back flip is a, a little bit disappointing to me. That's that's just me. So he's he's got his own prerogatives and his agent's got the right to shop around um, and do do what he thinks best is for his client. But there's a, for a little while now there's been some an angle from agents mm. in Australia to send their players to England to get game time and play first grade in the Super League. Uh, there's been a couple of players go over there, and Thomas Mikael is one. Mm -hmm. He's been over to Warrington. He comes back now, and and he's got a brand new contract at the Cowboys, doing really well. So, a couple of halfbacks that have gone over, Jackson Hastings. He's learnt the game, learnt about himself, learnt how to be a leader week in and week out at that level. Found out that he can come back to Newcastle. Done really well. Maybe this is what the agents thinking now. You're still young. Go to Lee, play a couple of years, play with Matt Moylan who's at the mm, Lee Leopards, oh, yeah. and get to learn your trade. Two years' time, have success, we may be able to bring you back a, a better player for the experience you're gaining. But we, we still don't know. It was interesting watching the game yesterday when uh, Fletcher Sharp scored that try early and he made that run and the commentators mm. were saying that he was actually the second in line mm, yeah. or meant to be the second in line. Mm. So maybe David Armstrong knew that, knew that he was third in the pegging. For whatever reason, he got the jump and got to play first when Caelan Ponga was injured. But all along, he knows, hey, I'm behind this Fletcher Sharp still. Mm. Regardless of what I'm doing, they've made me an offer and it's less than what Fletcher Sharp is getting. Who knows? Only the agent and, and the club and the player knows. So if he's made that decision... Go with it, and all the best if he does go to Lee. He's going to a club that's got a an owner that's a bit eccentric, but he's got money and he's willing to support them. They had success last year, first year back in Super League, and they won the Challenge Cup. So they're challenging. They're trying to buy um, some really good quality players. So he, he'll fit into a group that's trying to go in the right direction. Yeah, I think he'll go well over there. I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, he's done really good in his first four games at the NRL level, and. At worst, he'll play yeah. every week. Yeah. Um, on the Fletcher Sharp and Armstrong thing, that was the case. When Ponga went down, Sharp had a one injury. or two week injury. Yep. Yeah. And so they had to bring in Armstrong. And then yep. he, he kept himself in even when Sharp came back. Obviously, they won four out of his five games. Yeah. But then it was his, his he did his quad for a week. And that's what allowed Fletcher Sharp to now take over the rest of the Yeah, time. I think I said uh, something about Fletcher Sharp last time on, on the show. I, I remember we were coaching against um, SG Ball. So that was only last year he was yeah. playing SG Ball and reminded me exactly like Ryan Pippenhausen, the way he runs, the yeah, way he yeah. supports around the ball, his haircut, you know, everything. <laughs> like everything reminded me and I watched him and, you know, I watched some video and I'm thinking this guy's exactly like Ryan Pappenhausen, like, not many times he got at the back of shape. He just sat around the ruck and just waited for opportunities and just ran fast through the middle of the park. And yeah. he was good. He was good. So yeah, um, there's some some bright talent. You know, they had a couple of good fullbacks sitting behind Kalen Ponga, and I guess you know one door shuts, another one opens, and it's an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get back to Sharp a bit later in the show, but moving on now to the next uh, of the contract situations. Uh, AJ Kapoa, uh, he is a he was at the Tigers. He was sort of a fringe player in the Tigers' top team. He debuted back in 2020 and has been in and out of the team. I think he's played five games this season. He got an immediate release from his contract at the Tigers and won the lottery because he's signing. he signed on to immediately start at the Penrith Panthers for the rest of the season. 
and reunite with fellow Sacred Heart old boy Nathan Cleary. Sorry, I have to say that. I'm a Sacred Heart old boy as well. The two, the two boys that went to Sacred Heart, they're now both at the best team in the NRL over the past three years. What a good chance for a young player, eh, to just be able to go move over there. Yeah, yeah. Well, nothing's ever guaranteed in the game of rugby league, but it's an opportunity to be a little bit closer to, you know, like you said, a squad or a club that's done so well over the last five, six years um, and being able to learn off some of the, the best coaches down there and, and also play alongside some of the best best players. So, again, you still got to work your butt off to get into that team because they have a strong team. It's not going to be guaranteed that you're going to just walk straight in there. But, you know, I guess the Tigers, they're, they're, they're shopping players off. They're not letting players go. Um, but there's another opportunity for someone to go up and take an opportunity at, over at um, the Penrith Panthers alongside Zaya Papali, who's gone over there from the Tigers as well. So, you know, great a great um, opportunity, and that's all it is. It's an opportunity to to keep um, you know sharpening your your tools and getting crafting your craft and get out there and try and get in that squad. Yeah, it's just another side story to the drama at the Tigers, isn't it? That this player's decided to leave at a young age, but as you said, he's hit the lottery, going to a fantastic club and a fantastic organisation and a a great setup and group at the Panthers. He'll definitely have to go there with the mindset that Blair is saying, oh, you know, look at just wanting to learn, soak up everything from the players around you, be prepared to sit back for a little bit and earn your time that you get, like everybody else that's been there. And if he's willing to do that, he'll come out of it a, a lot better player. He will grow every single day if he's willing to do that and be patient and bide his time and get himself a chance to play NRL level with one of the best teams in the comp. There's, there aren't many teams like that in the competition where you can say that, but Penrith is definitely one of them. But again, it, go back to it, just more drama for the Tigers that another player jumping ship. Absolutely. Confitari Estovia, by the way, AJ. Uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but guys, we'll stay on the Tigers because <laughs> Galvin, Lachlan Galvin, uh, has quelled you know all of that big buzz last week uh, of him wanting out and all of that. Mm. He's committed. He said, "Listen, I'm going to see out my contract at the very least. I'm not going to, you know, whine and not not whine and moment. That's the wrong way to say it. But he's committed and." Uh, he had a meeting with his, him and his parents had a meeting with uh, Shane Richardson to sort it out. So it seems like at least that might be some good news for the Tigers that Galvin is going to be locked in for the until the end of next season. Yeah, I think, you know, along with everything else that's going on at the Tigers, you know, thankfully they got a win over the weekend. It's kind of settled things a little bit down. But, you know, Lachlan Galvin's name's been all through the media over the last two weeks. And for a young 18-year-old to be hearing those things, and you can say you're not on social media and you can say you're not listening or reading papers, it's everywhere down in Sydney. So no matter where you go, people know who you are. They're going to be saying, what's going on, asking him questions. I think the best thing that he could do is back himself and what he's done anyway to get him to where he is already is to back himself. And I guess the, the important thing with these young guys is making sure they have the right support around them. You know, family is important. Obviously, having an agent you trust is important. And so if he's put trust in his agent, I think, you know, that's we've just got to we've got to realize that he's putting trust in the people that he trusts around him. So um, a great, I guess, for him is just to, to stand up and man up and go after these next couple of years, if that's what it is. But I think a lot of the pressure come from the outside. When when they heard about him wanting to leave, a lot of the pressure come from the outside. When Shane Richardson come out and said no, and then these anti-tampering rules, uh, you know, and I think it's the first time someone's actually brought that in, although it still happens in the game behind scenes. Um, you can't tell me that, you know, in the background, his agent hasn't been doing things. But every agent does it. It's not just his agent. There's everyone out there that does the same thing. And because the Tigers are under pressure and they've been spoken about a lot, there was only one way for Shane Richardson to do it is to come out and put that out in the public so that everyone knows. And everyone knows. So, um, you know, this is where it's got to. So I think for him, buckle down, keep, keep working, keep crafting, keep sharpening your tools and keep being the best player kid you can be. But at the same time, you know, just just hang, keep yourself around people that you trust. Yeah, it's a lot for an 18-year-old. It's a lot to be an NRL player, first and foremost, as an NRL, as a as an 18-year-old. But also then to manage everything else that comes with being off the field and being an NRL player and all the demands and the ask and what Blair is saying, 
being a public figure, but then you've got to surround yourself, and this is tough to do at 18, mm. but this is more for parents out there. Um, make sure you're surrounding yourselves by people you can trust, whose advice you can trust and believe in. That's the important thing, because you know, like most parents, uh, they don't know everything that goes on, the intricacies and the politics that go on. That's where the agents mm. come in. They understand everything and they know how to fight the corner for the player. But you've got to have somebody that you fully trust with you, all your your details and all your affairs. So that's important before you just go ahead and sign with an agent. That's something for, for Galvin. No doubt he's got full trust in his agent. But as Blairy says, they all shop you around. They all want's best for the player because then that mm. reflects on getting them the best for them. But, yeah, it's just a bit more drama again for the Tigers that they haven't needed. I'm glad the young fellow's settled down. He's just that. He's a young man. He's still 18. He doesn't have to look at being an, NR, uh, an origin player yet. Just learn your craft. Be at the Tigers. Learn under Benji. Take your time and uh, just sit back and enjoy everything that's going on at the moment. Enjoy the ride for now. Just just learn your craft. You know, you know what I think? I think these tough times will make him stronger for his learnings moving forward after his next couple of years because if I put myself in the old shoes and the old boots that I used to wear at the West Tigers, I think if I didn't go through those tough times down there as a, a player, as a person, as trying to find support around me, I wouldn't have been able to get for anything because those things... Um, made me stronger it made me closer to my own family but also gave me a lot of trust in the people that I actually hung around because those were the ones that come closer when times were getting tough and um, if the, if this doesn't strengthen his connection with the ones that he trusts then he's going to have to try and look for people that are, he's going to like you said that are going to guide him into his future because you know these tough times don't last forever but He's just got to keep working his butt off to keep sure. doing what he's doing to get to where he is and where he wants it to keep chasing that dream because this will only make him stronger. This will only make him better. This pressure that's coming from the outside would only help him develop into where he wants to go. So embrace that, go after yeah. it, and we'll keep working hard. Sweet. Next up, we'll move on to the Dragons doing some business. Uh, ben Hunt is apparently now going to sign an extension after last year. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, all the dramas that was happening there, but he's spoken with Flanagan and he's happy that the way the Dragons are going at the moment. So he's going to sign a one-year extension uh, to the end of next season. And then apparently they're also trying to wheedle their way into uh, Damian Cook's thoughts. They're yeah. trying to... They've heard that South's uh, struggling for money or cap space or something like that. And so... They are thinking of offering him a two-year deal to Damian Cook. So yeah. the Dragons are definitely making moves. They signed Tyrell Sloan as well. Yeah, there's a couple of great, great um, signings if they get, you know, Damian Cook over the line as well. And I think um, what well, they'll take Ben Hunt for 36. Um, and I think he's playing out of his skin. And I think he's, I don't think he's done us done a, anything wrong in his time at the Dragons. You know, for the money that he's on, I think he's given everything he has for that team. I think he's been one of their their top class players since his signing there with all the pressure coming from, you know, the Broncos and coming out into the Sydney and being around, you know, being a big signing as well, marquee signing. You know, whatever he's done, he's done because he's been committed to what he was what, what he wants to do and I guess Flanagan sat down with him when he was thinking about, you know, getting out of there and wanting to leave and given him, I guess, give him some hope of where the direction of the t club is going and the team. And it's when you get, you know, someone like Ben and you get people around him and good signings around him. You know, Damien Cook, if they get Damien Cook around, it's only going to help Ben Hunt be better with what he's doing as well. So he goes from, you know, not wanting to be at the club, but sitting down with Shane Flanagan and talking about, I guess, what it looks like and the plan that it looks like for him. So wanting to extend another year and take himself out to 36, gee, that's not bad for a 36-year-old, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, whilst they're not yet challenging at the top of the table, they're going in the right direction as a club. Shane Flanagan's really turned them around as far as the playing group and with very few additions. You know, he's brought Kyle Flanagan in and Raymond Faitala Mariner who have been very, very good for them. Uh, their pack has a different attitude about it. So he's able to play off the back of that. And he is. He's, he's playing some of his career best at the moment for both Queensland and for St George. 
Uh, looks like Shane Flanagan's given them the keys to the car and he's just getting the team around. His, his kicking game is dangerous. His run threat is as dangerous as it's ever been. And he again, we talked about Latrell last week. He's happy. He's happy doing what he's doing. And um, obviously he's real happy and he's going to sign again, which will be a big boost for further recruitment. And just like we said about players wanting to know who's going to be coaching in order to to sign a new contract and who's going to be leading the group. They also want to know what's been a, going to be around them. And we'll talk about Damien Cook, I think that'll be uh, an interesting buy. they would be a good get if they are. And some of the turmoil and him having, whilst they've changed coaches, I get that him having to drop back to reserve grade would still sting. He'll want to get back into origin contention again, get back in that conversation. And if he can get to a group that's got some steadiness, some stability as far as coaching and the group playing together, they'll only get better and better. So, yeah, I think those two together could be dangerous. Mm. You know, as that spine was slow and you're talking about re-signing, they can start to build something going forward. Yeah, moving on to two big uh, or noteworthy re-signings, uh, Mitch Barnett and Jack Bostock, two-year extensions at the Warriors and Dolphins respectively. Um, I'm sure you're happy about Mitch Barnett, or both, all of us. Yeah. We all love Mitch Barnett, 18th man of the Blues. You're going to get your chance, game three, mark my words. But, yeah, he's re-signed at the Warriors and then Jack Bostock as well. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, we spoke to Mitch after the game on, on, on Saturday and if you, sp- if you said to him three years ago, would he stay longer at, at the Warriors, he most probably would have thought no. Um but when you spoke to him, you can see the passion about what what he does and why he does what he does. He's becoming a leader there at the Warriors, and he's not a big talker. But he said he's trying to find his voice. He's a big. He leads with his actions, and we see that consistently every game that he plays. In two years, it's great. It's a great signing for the Warriors. I think he's been, if not their best player on ground so far this year, with the performances that he has. Even with those people being on the sidelines as well, he's the only guy that's played every single game. Every time he's played, I've loved the transition from middle to back row, back row to middle, what he's done and what he's able to do. He's, he's really um, an intense person when you talk to him and he's, you know, he looks at you and he stares you in the eyes and he's, he's, he's quite, I guess he's, he's what you see on the field is much better what you get on the, on the outside as well and he's, he's pretty easy to wind up as well. So he's got a bit of a switch and I think if you've seen his, his games before uh, the Warriors at Newcastle, he was a firebrand of a player. He does play it on the line, but he's been able to play, I think, his career best football at the Warriors, I think, and it, deservedly so. He gets two years, and they love having them here in the Warriors. The players love him. The coaching staff love him, and it's a great signing for the Warriors because they can build some some real, um, you know, these young forwards around, the, around Mitch Barnett, the way that he carries himself consistently every day and then leading into the game. His preparation is second to none, and these young guys can learn some stuff off him. And Jack Bostock, great signing for for the, the Dolphins. Um, being a great winger for them this year, uh, can get up high. You know, he's a target in the air. So I think it's a great signing for both clubs, you know, moving in the right direction, both clubs. Yeah, he's a great keep for the Warriors. He's a great re-signing. I was uh, really impressed with how he was in the middle. And that, you know, he's mm. tough anyway, how he plays, but his engine... And his uh, agility was a standout when he was in the middle. But I liked him when he was at Newcastle on the edge. So when they move him to the edge for the Warriors, I think that's where he suited best. I think his run run threat on the edges at smaller halves or even over back rowers, he's, uh, he's damaging. But if they were to put him back in the middle, just the same. He's matured a lot. He seems like he's matured a lot. Some of what Blair is saying about his firebrand and his aggression and toning some of his uh, penalties down and not getting too hot-headed. That comes with being a leader and being an example around the club and around the dressing room and around the field every single week. And he's, he's grown into that to the point where he's had the armband. He's had the captain's mm. armband a couple of times for the Warriors. And mm. obviously he's got that respect from the coaching staff and also from the playing group itself. So... That speaks volumes. That speaks volumes for him and he'll only get better for them. So that's a that's a really good sign of the club and where they want to go to have him and uh, James Fisher-Harris together. They'll have two really good leaders. Really, <laughs> A couple of aggressive dudes too. Very Ooh. much so. Uh, Josh Bostock, 
been a been a bit of a find on that wing, on the left wing. And big tall thing, big tall thing that's rangy. Mm -hmm. um, still learning, still learning the game. And every week he's getting busier and busier, getting himself more and more involved in the game as he as his confidence grows and as the confidence in the coach grows. So uh, already this is something that's got the hallmark of Christian Wolf. He's taken over next year. He's yeah. starting to build his team already. Uh, I promise this is the last one on the contracts. <laughs> this is the last bit of news before we talk about the games. Uh, but it is a big one. Uh, Carter Gordon mm. signing with the Titans. So obviously played for the Wallabies, You know, was oh, playing cut. for the Melbourne Rebels in Super Rugby, who are now getting dissolved, that club. Uh, he's a number 10, a fly half, so, you know, a playmaker. Mm. He's coming over and he's signed until 2026. He's joining um, fellow Wallaby Mark Noongani Tuase is joining the Roosters as well, both the two Wallaby boys. Exciting for the Titans fans? Yeah, well, I think, I don't know, I guess if you look at the Titans side, they're, they're trying to find something. Um, they haven't been as consistent, I guess, it may be cover for Kieran Foran, but I still think he's got a fair bit to learn in the game. Like, um, yeah, he's only he's only young. He's a he's a big body. He plays obviously at in the ten position, which would be either a, a six or a seven in in league. And he's obviously got an understanding of rugby, and they play a lot of field position, quite similar to league, but not so. You know, we're not trying to kick it out. We're trying to play the long game. So I think he's got a great boot on him. He's a goal kicker. Um, be interesting to see how it goes. I think, you know, you're always, everyone's always on the hunt for the next best thing, and whether it's rugby player or a league player, and it's always a young kid or, you know, an older guy. But, you know, I guess you're you're picking what you see, and they see something in this guy that can, can change, I guess, where the Titans are at the moment. And I guess he's got a long way to go to develop himself into a league player, but it'll be great to watch his progression, both boys, uh, in the game of... Of, of league so um, you know I, I guess if they think it's a great signing it's a great signing for them he's played international rugby he's played at the highest level he played in, he's played in big games he played, he's played in big moments um, so I think it's a great signing I think he'll learn a lot about rugby league and he'll find himself hopefully playing playing next year yeah there aren't too many code hoppers nowadays I don't remember in the early 90s late 80s there were quite a few all Blacks, Inga Tuangamala included, Matthew Ridge used to jump over, and in England there were quite a few Welsh rugby union blokes like Jonathan Davies used to switch, and it was quite regular. There's hardly any nowadays. I think Sonny Bill was probably the last one to do it successfully. So it, it stands out a bit, the fact that it doesn't happen as much as it used to, but you know, there's an attraction there for him to come across and challenge himself, which I like. I like people getting out of their comfort zone and willing to challenge themselves in something totally different to what they're used to. But the side story to this for me is, it's probably an indication of where Australia rugby is. Mm. You know, they're struggling for money. The, the Rebels, the fact that that franchise made the playoffs this year, but all season they've had money problems hanging over them. And the fact that they've closed has been hanging around throughout the season, from right from the start when they lost their CEO at the start mm. of the season. So the players have probably been looking after themselves and been looking out for things. So maybe I want a challenge, but I've got to get to something where I'm going to get some stability as well. He'll, he'll know the magnitude and the size of the challenge that's ahead of him. And I think in the conversations that the Gold Coast Titans would have had with him, they say, oh yeah, I like this kid. I like the fact that he's willing to put his hand up mm. and he wants to give this a go. And time will tell. Time will tell. He'll need a good preseason under his belt, at least, at least, and then some games next year. I think it'll be too rushed to expect something out of him too soon. Give him some time. Give him some time to learn the environment, learn the game, learn the intricacies of how our game works as opposed to what he's been used to. Well, the good thing, he's only 23. Yeah. So he's got a lot of learning and development to go in his game. You know, if if he can learn real quickly, he's out there in, in 2025 20, and he's hit the ground running. He's only signed two years, which is, I guess, a, a yeah. safety blanket for the Titans as well. Is like you sign him on for a big deal, you just don't know what you're going to get. Um, got a lot of learning and development to do in the game of rugby league. So, yeah, not I reckon a good signing for sure. Um, so it was the... Oh, sorry. You go, Dills. You go, Dills. 
jumping in, I'm assuming he's going to play somewhere in the halves. How difficult do you think that transition is going to be for him trying to learn how to play, obviously, a playmaking position from Union to a playmaker in rugby league? He's probably going to play New South Wales Cup or whatever the yeah. equivalent is. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be Queensland Cup up there. And I think, yeah. like, the more games he can play before he gets into NRL, so wherever they can get some trials and get him under going there, like, he could be a fullback as well. He could be a fullback as well. Um, I guess he understands the, uh, the the whole get to the end of the set, kick long, kick to the corners. Like that's what they kind of they. It's quite similar in rugby union, but we're not kicking it out. Um, I guess the the hardest thing is you know with our halves, we want them taking the ball to the line, and I think not too many times you see the union boys get right and close into contact defensively. I think he's a big body. You know, being able to read the plays, being able to move quick, I think he, he can cover that off. But that's all learning and development, so he's still got a fair way yeah. to do there. But I think, you know, for a half, I think they can adjust. He, the thing that I think will help him is obviously he's a bigger body, so he doesn't become a target when you're coming into the game and you're a smaller body. I think if he can be nice and strong defensively, I think the attack stuff will be out, they'll be work, they'll be able to work that out. Yeah, it depends on what type of player he is. Mm. If he's a more player, then he'd probably play in the halves. If, and he's got a kicking game, even more so if he's a big body and he can handle defending in the front line. If he's a runner and he's got some speed and he likes the open space, they may put him at fullback mm. or in the outside backs. And you know, Ricky Stewart was a half that converted to rugby league and he, they put him straight in the halves, whereas Frano Bodica, who was a half, yeah. mm. went to Wigan, they started him on the wing mm. yeah. and slowly brought him yeah. in, in, into the halves as time went by. So he started on the wing, learnt the game, Watched him from the outside, went to centre, then ended up coming to the Warriors yeah. and playing in the halves at Rugby League. So they gave him the time to learn, and that's what he has. What Blair is saying, he's got time. He's got time to learn. Don't be in too much of a rush. So, yeah, it depends what sort of makeup and his skill set yeah. to be what position he's going to make and, and what the Titans need, what Des Hasler wants. I believe Gordon was uh, the Wallabies' like top pick as their ball playing. Uh, mm. Playmaker. Right. They have other guys who are more, you know, efficient kickers and stuff like that. I think he's more on the ball of a half. Or well, we, yeah, we got in front of like Quay Coopers and, yep. and those boys, the, the the previous incumbents for the, the yeah. Wallabies. They went for a different direction. Didn't obviously pay off for them, but <laughs> hey, he, he's gone through some tough times. He went through a tough time and hopefully he's come out stronger. You know, the last couple of years has been tough for him. You know, obviously the Rebels and then the World Cup with the, the Wallabies. Uh, so hopefully he comes out at the other end tougher and stronger. Hopefully the Titans can, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. keep keep progressing through their journey. Um, Off the bottom of the table. <laughs> I was Sorry. telling the truth about the contracts, but uh, we're not. We're still not going into the games yet because there's a bunch more news. So uh, we'll move to the New South Wales. Um, Country New referees. South New South Wales. New, New South, South Wales. Wales. Sorry. Country referees <laughs> uh, have have gone <laughs> on strike, um, fearing for their lives mm. in an ever increasing wave of violence and intimidation in the bush. So there's obviously been stuff like death threats and stuff like that for the um, yeah. referees out in the out in the bush, New South Wales country. Yeah, we've, we've on the show, we've been huge advocates of, you know, uh, respecting, I guess, the referees, especially in our local games, uh, especially in our kids' games, but similar to, obviously, the country, um, because they are normally volunteers. Uh, they are normally the ones that turn up. No one else wants to do the job, and we are quick to shoot them down. So I think this is, um, this is massive news. I think, you know, we encourage... Families, we encourage friends to respect the people, even respect the opposition to the point that hey, if if the ref makes a wrong call, everyone makes a wrong call. We're all human, so I think it's the same as in, when it comes to first grade. We've seen what's happened in the NRL. People say things, and you you get in trouble for it. You can't just say what you want. So, uh, for me, this is this is a not 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 good. I think you know out in country is miserably even tougher. You know, if we go up in the far north far north here in New Zealand, there'd be, there'd be someone's parents riffing a game. And if you start abusing the refs, it ends up bringing the fans into it from the opposition yeah. and it ends up having an all-in brawl. That's what normally happens here in New Zealand. So you don't want to see that. I've seen some stuff over on social media through, like, over in Australia, you know, families running on the field and hitting people. 
Um, you don't want to get to that point. And someone that's getting death threats, like that's it's so bad. I just think um, we need to respect the people that have the whistle. We need to respect, be respectful on the sidelines. We need to respect the opposition, respect the kids that are playing the game, all the adults. Because if it does come to this point, we're going to lose these people. And these they are a big part of our game. If we don't have refs on the field, our games don't go ahead. Um, so respect those guys. This is so bad and it's not a good look for the game of rugby league. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful that we have this carry on in our game. And it's, it's an ugly look for our game to start with. Yeah, it's all about respect. And referees are a dying breed, unfortunately. You know, it's it's a thankless job being a ref, you know, but we've got to be more respectful at the job that they do to put to get that whistle and stand out in the middle of the field and do your best to try and make the right decisions at the right time. You know, you're going to get it wrong every now and again. We all do. We're all human, and we've got to be understanding of that sometimes. You know, it's frustrating. I get that. I've had some moments as a coach where I've been frustrated with referees' calls, but at the end of the day, they're human just like I am and they've made mistakes just like I do. So you've got to understand that. But we need more. We need more referees. And it's bad enough when the referee's a little bit older, but, you know, some of these referees are young kids too, mm. mm -hmm. you know, that are, are trying to make their way, just like players do, to get up. There are some young referees trying to get on the ladder and trying to forge a career. But like Blair said, they're doing it voluntarily. They're doing our game a service mm. and they're doing our game a favour because without them, there is no game. It was Blair said, there's, there is no game. We can't do it without them. And as I say, there's a dying breed. We had a game on the weekend um, where one of the referee had to go down because of a calf injury. So we had to grab someone from our board to run the touchy. Mm. Uh, there was no one else. Mm. This is where the... This is where we're at. We need more referees, but we can't attract them with this sort of behaviour and this sort of carry-on. It's got to stop. And it starts with us as coaches and people in the game and this message to parents. You've got to be the examples. Parents have to set that example to the children because it's learned behaviour. Yeah, so I, you know, I obviously coach in the under eight level and I end up chucking on the grabbing the whistle and um, doing our games as well. And... Well, I've had some incidents there where, you know, parents have said, oh, it's a high tackle. And I try and encourage them just to hey, just let the ref make the decision. I saw the high tackle. I'll go and talk to the kids. So because I think if if one side is talking about the opposition's kids, then the other side starts <sighs> getting involved. And that's where the trouble ends up that's happening. Right. So as well as if you're on the sideline, and yes, I get it. Sometimes it's your kid and something happens to your kid on the field and you care about them and you love them and it's dangerous. But you allow the refs to ref the game and they will keep it nice and clean as much as they can. Um, you know, I've seen some high tackles and me being me, um, talk to the kid, hey kid, just keep those tackles down below the ball. And I think it, it works out. If, you, if you're a ref that can try and keep the field nice and calm on the field, then the, the, the families on the sidelines are nice and relaxed as well. So... Um, yeah, it's a tough job, um, you know, riffing and I don't know, I wouldn't be able to do it at that, that high level, I'll tell you that much, and, you know, doing the kids is tough enough. Yeah, we don't talk too much about that other game, but uh, <laughs> my son played a couple of games in the UK, and one thing that stood out for me was the respect that they all had for the coaches, for the referees. Um, you watch the games, there's very little chirping back from players, but to the point where after the game... The referee would come over, both teams would be together, the, or the parents would be together from both teams, and you clap the referee and you'd say thank you for your, for what you did today. Now that's mm. a, that's appreciation, and that's why the referees keep coming back. But we need to adopt some of that, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, moving on to Lycra. Ly <laughs> wow. Leichhardt wow. Oval. Lycra. Uh, what? What are you wearing? Show them your lycra you wear. Lycra Oval is getting a forty million dollar injection uh, to be renovated. I don't know when the last time it's had mm. work done, but obviously, you know, it's not the most flash stadium in the world. But it means a lot to the Tigers fans, yeah. and they've won two out of two games there this season. So. Yeah, a combination of government, uh, New South Wales government, federal government, all 
pooling in money, $40 million. They're going to be getting new uh, female change rooms, new stands, just cleaning up some stuff around there. Pretty good, eh? Yeah, I think this is great. Um, I think the, me the rugby league media pumped this up more than anything. Um, because it doesn't matter how old the stadium is or how bad the grounds are, the fans have not stopped turning up. Uh, yes, you know, it'd be nice to start getting some stunt stuff done now, but I don't think it would have changed the people from not turning up. That, that, game, that, crowd, that crowd, sorry, that crowd, that area, you know, that field is, is iconic uh, to everyone in that area. I've played on that, um, on that field on a Sunday afternoon. It's packed. And the people that turn up, you can't see a patch of grass out there. And they turn up because they love turning up to Leichhardt Oval. No matter if it's old looking or the changing rooms are, are bad, it's they're not in the changing rooms. It's the players. So I think when it, when we, we talk about um, you know needing a revamp, it was coming from the media, rugby league media, because they're the guys, the older guys that are sitting in there trying to get into the corporate boxes and they weren't flash enough for them. So it's nice that they get a revamp. It's great that, um, you know, they keep everyone happy, um, but it wouldn't have stopped it wouldn't have stopped the fans turning up if they didn't get a revamp. But it's just nice that they're going to keep this local ground turning over and the fans are going to keep going. I think that the biggest thing for me is not losing Leichhardt Oval. So... I'd, I'd, would, I'd love them. I love that they've been able to put some money into it. The thing for me was not losing Leichhardt Oval and having to move games somewhere else because they're saying that it's not up to the standards of rugby league. Yeah, there's a couple of old stadiums still around: Balmore, Jubilee, Cogra, and uh, Leichhardt. But what they have is character. They have mm. character and history. That is a part of our game that you don't want to lose. And I get all the talk, and I. I understand and, and I believe in it too that the game needs to move forward aesthetically. So I think if we can have an historical ground that still looks new but holds some of that, like my perfect thing would be have some brand new stands around. I'm not sure if you keep the hills or not. Oh, you've got but, to keep the hills. But keep the scoreboard. Yeah. Keep, you've got to keep that scoreboard. Yeah. That's that's part of Leica. That's part of the old fabric of you, you can still have a video screen, but have that old mm. scoreboard as part of it. But yeah, the revamp is needed. There's no doubt about that. And I, I think they've got to keep the game moving forward. There's a couple of other clubs, and I've, I've spoken vocally about the Warriors. They need to revamp their ground too. So if they need it, so do Leichhardt, definitely. And it's going to be better for the game, better for the club. It's a... Uh, it's surprising how teams do when they have a new stadium or a new training ground. Mm. You know, they, the fortunes just turn around. The, the mood picks up. Your pride in wearing, representing the club picks up because you have something nice to represent. So, yeah, the future's bright now for the Tigers as far as that's concerned. They've got to keep the players now. Now, this is the last, last piece <laughs> of news, um, and I'll let Willie, I'll let mm. you... Break this down. Be excited. Obviously, you're the you're the in the know out of any of us on this. Samoa and England's tests have been announced. The dates: twenty seventh of October, second of November. Confirmed. Yeah, confirmed. confirmed. Confirmed a two game tour to the UK, following on the back of uh, Tonga's three test series last year. Um, looking forward to going over there. Obviously, uh, the last game that the two teams played was the World Cup semi final. They'll be hungry. Um, seen some videos and seen some promotional uh, flyers going around already. They're talking about revenge. And they want to <laughs> get revenge for that. And they, I understand that. They were hurt um, yeah. desperately. I remember speaking to some of the people from what, England Rugby League. They felt that weird ruin. They had all the money on England and yeah. Australia going to the World Cup well, you, final. You guys were booked on a flight out of there. 100%. Uh, so bad. <laughs> so Samoa even went to the hotel and England were booked in. Oh, so, <laughs> every, oh. so everything was against Samoa and they turned the tables, but they'll be wanting to avenge some of that. We're just focused on getting our best squad together, mm. try and put a, uh, put a group together that can do well in the series and try and get a win, we'll try to build towards a World Cup and get a squad that's going to have that stability that I talked about and be around for a little while, have players that don't just want to play for this year, that don't just want to play in one series, that want to represent Samoa today, but tomorrow and next week. 
yeah, there's some talented players you fellas have got, Willie, to pick from, those, yeah. those Blues Origin boys. Oh. A lot of wingers too. A lot, <laughs> lot, lot of wingers, a lot, <laughs> lot, of, lot of good wingers. Um, I think this is great. I would have loved to see uh, Samoa be over here and playing the Pacific Championship. But again, there's opportunities over in England. Um, you know, there's a lot of money involved in there as well. The games try to grow. Um, but yeah, one, one time they'll be back in that Pacific Championship. will be good. Yeah, well, you've got first testers at Wigan. Nice. That'll be huge, going to Wigan uh, on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. Big, big crowd. Uh, home of the world champs. And then... Uh, Go to Mile Joint at Leeds. That'll be another big crowd. That's a, another stadium with some character, and you know yeah. they've revamped it. Be a be a good uh, exercise for all of us. Sweet. And finally, the news is over, guys. Uh, we can finally go on to the games, which most people were maybe awaiting for. And the first one: Dolphins versus the Sharks, thirty-eight to twenty to the Mina as Dolphins fins up, wins up. Uh, they just too good for the Sharks early, blew them out early and then yeah. held on to it the whole game. Yeah, very lucky, I think, the Dolphins. Um, you know, they've been a side that's grinded out most of their games, I reckon, this year with a couple of standout players all through there. They've had some standout players through the first, most most of the rounds of the competition and obviously having Herbie Farmworth back and Hammer, so we know what he can do and we speak about him every week and the things that he does on the field. Well, I think it was the battle of the fullbacks in that back half of the second half is who's going to, when you score, I score. And I think there was two times there when, you know, I thought both of them had each other covered when they scored those tries and they were some some great full-length field tries. 22-0 um, up, I thought, you know, when you think of the, the Dolphins and what they've been able to do, because they are attacking, good attacking team, they would have put... You know the sharks to the sword, but the sharks come back in there and true, true shark spirit. They hung in tough. They were gritty, and it come down to the last kick. Um, you know that last moment. I think what there was a a minute to go. They shifted to the left side and they go back out to the right. And you know Britton Nikora, who's been really good, playing really well for the sharks, gets the ball, gets down that short side, and then um, you know they score in the corner, and it was a conversion to try and win it. And Paul Nico Hines, and I, you know, and I think, you know, I'm feeling sorry for the bro. Mm. I'm feeling sorry for the bro. But again, this is rugby league, and this is the pressure you put yourself in consistently every single day. You live in these moments, you play for those moments, and he just wasn't wasn't gonna didn't ice that kick that put, would have put taken them into into a draw to go into golden point. But I think you know a, a, a classy game between both teams. Um, you know, one team would have been. Disappointed if the first half and the, the second team, the other team would have been disappointed if the second half. But a game that went right to the wire, and these are the games, and this is what rugby league does, and this is what rugby league's been doing over the last, you know, 15, 14, 14 weeks is that these are the games, this is why we play the game, because you just never know who's going to win. You could be at the top, you can be on the bottom, but you can come away with a with a two point win in, in a game where there's a team that scored in the, in the last seconds. So, um, you know, a great win from the Dolphins keeps uh, solidifying their, their self in the top four and a team that, you know, if I had a smoke at the start of the season, I think I might have said on air, it was, it was the Dolphins in the eight, but they're sitting in the fourth, the fourth position and, and playing some great rugby league. Yeah, very good. Very good, the Dolphins, especially to start with. They were out of the blocks too quick and before they knew it, they'd put some big punches on the Sharks. As Blair said, to their credit, they bounced back the second half and almost rescued a draw. But mm. a couple of moments for me, uh, Hammer's try. Yeah. A couple of people were talking about it as probably one of the best tries uh, ever. Uh, probably a bit much. Of <laughs> but best try of the year. Yeah, for me, best try of the year so best far. individual try of the year. Yeah, easy. Yeah. Easy. 98 metres. Collects the ball and Kennedy almost yeah. does enough to get him. And he stutters and just puts him off enough to go. And full credit to Kao Iro for chasing yeah. him all the way. And he never gave up on his his assignment there. But he's a freak of an athlete, as Hammer. And and a, you know, with our game needs those superstars. We need those highlight real moments for our crowd and, and our youngsters to strive and emulate. But. Uh, one person for the Sharks who I think has been great the last couple of weeks and I think it coincides with contract time is Royce Hunt. <laughs> Royce Hunt's oh, been very, very Royce strong. Been. been very, very strong for for the Sharks the last couple of weeks. Powerful. Um, scored a try, I think, last weekend. Went close this weekend. And he's, he's really punching holes for a pack that's got some big names 
but isn't really fronted up. He, he's definitely doing his job. But he went Katoa, Katoa scored in the corner late. Nico Hines had sprayed it way right. Mm. It just wasn't going to be that night at all. And they, I thought if they had rescued the draw, probably a bit unfair on the Dolphins. Mm. They'd been the better side. So, yeah, good win for them. They continue their good form. Yeah, Royce Hunt, man, you're so right about that. He came on <laughs> when it was at 22-0 and mm. the Sharks scored the next three tries. Then he went off, and then that's when the Dolphins scored again. Big Rolls Royce. I think, I think, I think that, he's linked to the yeah. Rabbitohs as well. Well, but I think it's the, that's, <coughs> I guess that's the important role of bench players as well is that you are still as effective if you're starting or if you're coming off the bench, and your role as a as a bench player is to come on and change the momentum or pick up the momentum of what the starting middles have already done. So you play a key role. To, to the side, um, you know your your pack, your starting pack is only as good as your pack on the on the bench because the momentum off the back of what you've created, and if you don't create momentum, look like they were behind in the first half, is that you expect the guys off the bench to do the same thing? And Royce Hunt, the last two weeks, like you said, it's coincided with contract yeah. times, but he has been dominant with his twenty five minutes. Like that's all you need to do. Like go out there, give it your best for twenty five minutes, try and change the game, be nice and clean, and he's done that every time. Yeah, your job as a benchy is to one, either continue the momentum that the starters have got, yeah. or to observe and watch and see how you can yeah. best affect it to change the momentum if it's not going your team's way. Mm. And the other thing with the benchies is you may play longer time than the starters. Yeah. So and you can be the one to change the fortunes of the game. So the stigma that you're starting on the bench, yeah. no, you you are um, as effective, if not more effective and important to the side and the fortunes of the game than probably a lot of people think. Well, you sit on the sidelines and you can observe. You yep. watch, like you said, you, you watch what's going on. You watch what they're doing or what your team's doing wrong and need to be better at. If you're too close to the ruck, you know, all right, when I get out there, I'm going to be a little bit wider on the pass because they're getting me from markers. So your opportunity to sit back and watch is much where you're in the box seat when you're sitting on the sidelines and you go, all right then, so when I get on there, this 100%. is what I'm going to do to help the team. So an important role as a, as a bench player is you're not just sitting there just staying warm. You're sitting there watching and observing and seeing how you can come on and if not continue what's already done or go up another level and help your team get into a better position, which is what, what Royce Hunt's been doing the last two weeks, though, so enormous. And the whole Sharks back are like that. Obviously, they have a lot of middle forwards always on their bench. Mm. Uh, you know, Rudolph, Hamlin Wille, um Big boys. Hazelton, all yeah. of those boys. Big boys. Uh, and imagine what it's going to be like next season when Adam goes there. Someone's going to miss out. Yeah, yeah, that's what that looks like. Gonna miss out. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to the next game. Raiders versus Cowboys at GIO Stadium. 34-16 to 16 at the Cowboys. Another one of the team's bouncing to and fro everywhere and now they after their disappointing loss to the Warriors last week they bounce back and get a big win over the Raiders yeah pretty pretty straightforward win yeah it was tough from 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 Cowboys I thought they went after the um the Canberra Raiders and the Raiders you know would have been excited after their performances but um you know they tried too hard I thought in the first start of the heart I think Jordan Rapana which we give credit to because he's always in and around things, but sometimes there's a lot of errors around him because he's trying. Um, you know, going down short sides when it wasn't on, uh, was scooping from dummy half. But we like Jordan Rapana because that's what he does really well. Yeah. And when things don't come off, if it, there's, there's a lot of errors around him. And I'm sure, you know, there was a lot of errors from other people around him as well because sometimes he's just doing things that he sees as right, right now, uh, which... You encourage players as, as a coach to play what you see. And I, I spoke to him uh, during, during the week about, you know, why they, they comment that Ricky Schultz said he loves Jordan up and up but hates <laughs> coaching him. And the example he said to me is obviously these things, when you see something on the short side and there's a shift to the open side, but he sees a four on three, He's the player that grabs the ball and goes down the, yeah. on the four on three side, which is what you want to do in the game of rugby league. So I think that's where, I guess, they got wrong, I thought, on, on the weekend. Too many errors, too many little mistakes, especially close to the line. And then the Cowboys just crucified them with the way that they played. I thought they were um, strong, um, the Cowboys, with what they did. They needed to be after a disappointing effort against, um, you know, the Warriors. And they come out all guns blazing against... Um, against the Canberra Raiders. I'm also liking Ethan Strange. Hopefully we can convince him to come play for the New Zealand 
team. So, Ethan Strange, I know you're listening to this, bro. You tune in all the time. Surely you've subscribed <laughs> and liked. But, hey, yes, our Māori brother, you're coming over to New Zealand, bro. Us. I thought, no, I thought, you know, he's, he's a strong defender. He's elusive on his feet. He was trying really hard. He was trying really hard to get him out of some trouble there and just wasn't good enough in the end. And, you know, the Cowboys were strong. Yeah, it was all one-way traffic the first half. It was all Cowboys and at 22-0. Um, when you're in that position it's and you're behind, you've got to come out and it may take a little while, but you've got to show some resistance defensively, but then try and be the first to score. So when the Valheim scored after halftime to make it 28-0, it just almost made it impossible. They showed some fight back and led by Jordan Rapana, he was outstanding to try and get him back in it. He does, he plays on that instinct. Mm. And sometimes his teammates don't see him and sometimes he's got to do it in an individual way. And he, he ended up scoring the try to get him back in. Then Savage scored a try to make the, the scoreboard look a bit respectable. But yeah, it was one of the, the better games for the Cowboys this season. And you know, I think the commentators were saying it. I agree, it's amazing how much confidence players get when they play in the winning origin team and how it transfers to their team, to their club football, because Val Holmes... Been pretty pretty quiet. And I won't say he's been ordinary, but he's been pretty quiet this year for the Cowboys, but been good for Queensland in game one. And it was great on the weekend. Probably had his best game for the Cowboys this season last week against the Raiders. And the disappointing thing for the Raiders was one, uh, hearing their fans boo them at halftime. Yeah. You know, hearing yeah. them boo, boo them off. And then you look at their record at home, you understand why the fans are disappointed. Their, their defence is almost non-existent at home. I think they're 158 points against in their last four games for only about 50 points for. So their home record is abysmal at the moment. You know, it's something I'm sure Ricky Stewart will be trying to turn around, but they've got to do something to try and get their fans back on side because it's, it's, it's horrible when you're the home team and your fans are booing you off. You know what it is? It's probably that they do the Viking clap. They've got to <laughs> cut that out. You can cut the Viking clap? Cut it, man. Like, that's not motivating anyone, I don't reckon. <laughs> you get the whole, sta- the whole, like, stand of them all, like, awkwardly just... You reckon they've overused it? Yeah. Com- you know how that they picked it up from those football fans yeah, that, you yeah, know, yeah, up yeah. in the Nordic yeah. countries? Iceland. When you see Iceland do it, oh. it's like, whoa, intense. But then you just see, like, a one stand of the Raiders fans doing it, and you're like, ah... Uh, it's all right. May change it. You think it's run its course? Yeah. Kind of. I, I don't mind the horn and Have you, know, you all or stuff. You kind of? You think it's run its course? Oh, uh, yeah. I'll commit. Yeah, I think yeah. it's run its course. <laughs> run its course. Hey, like, yeah, you may be right. I think, you know, there's always room to change things and it may have, but I think they've built up this this tribalism now with it and it, they run on the back of that grand final run that they went and, you know, Michael Innes was down there one year when they beat him down there and he was giving them the Viking clap back. So I think it's become something for the Raiders. Um, whether it's run its course, I think they're, they're already committed. The, the fans yeah, yeah. have committed to it. They're, they're a community club. But like Uli said, it was, yeah, it's pretty sad to hear them getting booed off. And, and the commentary said that as well. They're getting booed off at half time. But the evidence is there. They haven't turned up at home. And normally it's like they're, it's the place where they respect the most, where the that everyone turns up and they put their body on the line, and but they just haven't done it this year. So I'm guessing the fans have a point and they'll have a reason to do so. Um, the NRL overall stats, uh, actually, I was surprised when I saw this. The Cowboys are pretty high up in some of them. So Jeremiah Nunai, obviously, 11 tries. He's tied second with a bunch of other boys. Only Dean Mariner mm. has more. Valentine Holmes is top point scorer, yep. 134 points. And Townsend and Drinkwater both have uh, 17 tries each, and they're the only two that are within striking distance of Ben Hunt, who has 20. So considering how bad they've been some games, they actually have you know still scored a lot of yeah. points. It's been their defence that's let the Cowboys down. We, you know, they're, they're quite similar to... They've got attacking players, you know, and Drinkwater's a big part of what they do attack-wise, and they can attack from deep in their own half, and Townsend's just as good with, with dead in around the middle of the park and Reese Robson. So they're a great attacking side, and they've got some players there, Nanai, who's really good at running good lines, Helam Luki on the other side. Uh, 
Finifuyaki. Finifuyaki is over there as well. So I think between like these young back rowers and the people that they have, they're a, a great attacking side. But defensively is where they've let themselves down this year. And you've seen that through games, but we know that they can score points. And, you know, between Townsend and Drinkwater, it's, it's pretty it's pretty good. Like, you know, 17 tries. Yeah, it's great. Tries. Great attacking numbers. It'll be interesting to see their defensive numbers. Mm. What are the odds that Nanaya gets the, what is it, golden, what's the try scoring award called? Try scoring award. The boat. What's the, what's top try scorer. Top, top try scorer. Try score. <laughs> is he not a, like, nah, a, it's just top try scorer. Oh, okay. No golden boots. Uh, no uh, golden boots. What do you reckon the odds are that he can keep up that rate? No. I'll just no. There's no, no, he, no he, he, he won't. He won't. He won't get the top try scorer. Okay, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> what are your um, What are you guys' thoughts on obviously Helam Lukey making the Origin squad? What do you think of his play at the moment? Like he's only just come back from injury. What did think Billy is seeing in that kid? I guess he's seen some his, his development grow. I think um, I said before earlier, I've said before he got injured, he was a young kid and he was exciting. I liked him. I've seen there's one, there was one game I watched Cowboys play the Broncos. Reese Rolls makes a break down the sideline and he was the only one that chased him down and I think he caught him in the corner and chucked him out. And I think when you think of Billy Slater and where he's come from, the effort areas when it comes to origin and the effort areas that he's used to, similar to what Billy used to do, is never give up and chase someone down to the end because you just never know what's going to happen. I think he's seen some of these good habits in Helam. So I think putting him in closer is a reward, but it's an opportunity to help him develop more as well and, and just keep him there at hand, hand length just so that he can have his chance when the time's coming. Yeah, he's a he's a handful. He's a competitor, and he competes on every single play. And he's got a massive wingspan. He's mm. a big, tall thing, mm. so it's hard to beat when you've got the ball because he's got such a, a reach defensively. But he also uses that wingspan to play footy and offload and pass and, and get through people. So yeah, he's got. I think he sees some potential in him. Mm. He's there's uh, no guarantees that he's gonna get on the field, but being around yeah. the camp for the week yeah. will give him a, a massive amount of experience and confidence going forward. And I think that's part of the plan when coaches pick 19 and 20 as well. If, if something happens to a back or to a forward, I'm sure uh, Gagai or Capewell will step up to the yeah. starting team and yeah. he may still get in there. Mm. He may get himself into that 18th position if things happen through the week. You know, we've got 10 days to prep, and that's a long time. There's a lot of training to be had, and things can happen. Next game up, Rabbitohs versus Broncos, 22-12 to the Bunnies. Their third straight win. Where's handy. your Bunnies jersey? <laughs> you know, I, I was waiting. <laughs> but yeah, you, jo- you dropped it. I was actually... You lost hope, eh? You lost the faith. No, no, no. I'm Rabbitohs hard, man. But I, I thought <laughs> I wore it last week. Rab- I probably Rab- shouldn't Rab- just wear it again. Penrith. Penrith I mean, hard, <laughs> Dolphins hard. <laughs> Which one? Uh, Brad, uh, you know, just whatever I'm feeling like, to be honest. I'm going to get a couple that, new uh, ones. The Dolphins soon. are a Queensland team too, mate. Yeah, but this is a off week from Origin, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, mate, this is, this is uh, um, yeah, Rabbitohs are building. Rabbitohs are building, and I think they've got the spine right. And we spoke about it last week, and we've spoken about, you know, a fair bit on this show about moving the boys closer to the ball and what they've done, Jack White, and um, you know, and we spoke about how you know square they're playing. Obviously, the excitement and the enjoyment that Latrell's having um, in his football obviously gives him the opportunity to play New South Wales. Um, we did say earlier when he was out of form or not, you know, happy with what he was doing, is to focus on his his club football and get that right first. And I think he's done that in the last three games. He's got them to where they are now and. You know, I thought they were a strong team, but the Broncos, for me, are, are concerning. Uh, you know, they haven't been able to perform as well as they would like to. A lot of errors in the game. What was it? Eighteen errors. You know, possession was way down. Um, completion rate sixty four percent. Like you can't beat a, a red hot Rabbitohs team at the moment. The way that they're playing with that much, you know, that that completion and that many errors. Eighteen errors is a lot in the game for a Broncos team. Um, you know, so I just don't think they were good enough, and they haven't been good enough the last couple of weeks. They lost to the Titans as well. Um, they are missing 
I think they are missing Adam Reynolds and the way that he controls and his leadership on the field, especially they're a, they're a young group. They've got a young spine in there as well. And the biggest difference when he's there is he can guide those guys around the field. Everyone can play their role. I feel like everyone's trying to do everything without just focusing on what they can control. And that's where Adam Reynolds comes in and plays the way that he does, kick to the corners. But of some couple of brain explosions in there, you know, Jordan Rickey, hard one, I think, though. Real hard one for me, Willie, I think. He was in between uh, two players. He had a half inside him and Cameron Murray. And the ball to me looked like it was going to go to Cameron Murray, but at the last second it goes to the short runner and he jams him. I think he gets away if he lowers his contact and doesn't contact his head. Um, he hits him because, you know, if someone's running inside my shoulder and he's a support runner and he's that close to catching the ball, nine times out of ten you're going to take him out because you're concerned. Because if he does get the ball, he just runs straight through you. So I think if he was to be able to just lower his target, hit under the ball, yes, he's still going to get penalised. He may not have got sent off for ten minutes. So I think... Um, some just some correction on what he was doing. So now he's going to miss two to three weeks. I think he'll take the early guilty and get the two weeks. But I guess it started the all-in ruckus where Latrell comes in. No need for Latrell to be doing that. He's just got himself in the right frame of mind after having some time on the sidelines for similar incidents. There's no need for Latrell to come running in there and you know just made it worse by you know running in and everyone getting all in there where. You know, as an honest, like it's a it's a tough decision to make a split decision decision for Jordan Ricky to make a decision who he's going to tackle, and he makes the wrong decision. It wasn't on purpose, similar to what we're talking about, guys not going out there to hurt anyone. But Latrell comes flying in and just starts up all the stuff. So they had to do it with you know twelve men out there, but still a strong performance from the Rabbitohs. I thought they were they were good. Yeah, some concerning signs for the Broncos, especially defensively. You can't cough up that much ball. And expect to be off defensively and win the game. But yeah, they're missing Reese Walsh for me. He's a he's a big loss at the back. You know, Tristan Saylor's a wonderful player, but he's come up with a couple of howlers in the last couple of weeks. Some poor drop balls. Uh, there was one and it was a tough kick. It wasn't quite a Matt Burton kick, but Latrell put a bomb up that he dropped and then Latrell ends up scoring the try mm. on the back of it uh, off that scrum. So yeah, the Broncos, who have, as I've said here, they were my favourites to to be in the grand final and, and go close to winning it, but they need their full complement of superstars on the field. They need everyone out there, and Adam Reynolds especially, to lead them around and play off the back of Carrigan and Haas and the go-forward that they generate. Souths, back to it, happy again, on a roll. Some of their players are finally finding that form Kolomatangi again mm -hmm. was outstanding. We spoke about it. Blair yeah. has alluded to it about having Jack Whiten in the halves with Cody Walker and just his run threat. Jack Whiten's run threat, he, he took the ball early, put it under his wing, beat a couple of defenders, got a quick play of the ball. Damien Cook gets out the back yeah, and scores right. first try of the game because he's running, because he's dangerous, because he's strong and he can generate some of that. So, they're, yeah, they're back to some of it. They look like a really happy and content squad again. Don't be surprised if they're knocking on the door of the eight yeah. from where they were. Um, with the squad that they've got, if they continue in this vein of form, they're going to be dangerous. They're, they're, they're reliant on a couple of teams dropping some games around them, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible for them. They're very, very dangerous right now. Well, I think, you know, the, the Kalon Watangi stuff, he's moved from back row, put him into the middle, and I think that's where he's come back to what he done really well as a back row. Yes, Obviously, you're not running lines, but it kind of reminds me of the Jackson Ford Warriors move. He's now in the middle of the park, and it just solidifies, simplifies. simplifies their role of get the ball, run hard, and create momentum for the next person, someone like Damien Cook, off to run off the back of that. So, been another a massive decision from coaches, but like two two big moves have paid off, I think, for both both coaches. How about the um, try from Alex Johnson to put him out right uh, yes. second, uh, yeah. all time, take it, taking over from Billy Slater. I, I like how they had Billy Slater there. Obviously, we're thinking there's a chance Johnson's yeah. going to try, so they had Billy on the yeah. commentary, commentary to explain yeah. that he's taken over from him. Uh, he's now 191 tries, only behind Ken Irvine, 212. Wow. So. You know, there's still time in his career, yeah. I think, for him to go that distance if he if he wants to. That, that's huge. Uh, it it would be a um, 
massive day or milestone if he was to surpass, you know, Kevin Irvine in 212. And I think, like you said, there's plenty of time on his side. I think, you know, when he's when he's on the field, he's always highly likely to score a try. He's always in and around it. He can score tries. He can find find the trial line. So. A massive achievement um, for him, you know, to go past Billy Slater, who we all know what he's done in the game, the way that he played. But, you know, getting close to 212, it's enormous. Yeah, phenomenal number. 191 in your career. That's ridiculous. Well, what, um, how many games? He's to be yeah, at about 200 games. Yeah, yeah. I've got 12 in my career. And- <laughs> <laughs> One, 191, yeah, I'll take 12. I'm, I was just happy to take 12, to be honest. Not, you know, 191, that's a massive achievement. I think it's great, man. Yeah, and that, and that, Ken, that Ken Irvine record stood for 40 yeah. years, 50 years. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, it's almost untouchable or thought was going to be untouchable. Um, it could possibly be done. And it's even more crazy, I suppose, um, amazing that he's done it when you think that not long after the Wayne Bennett or around that time that he was there, he was out the door. Mm. They were shopping him out. They were going to move him away. And yes. They were looking for him to get out. He was willing to stay for a lot less than what he was on and prove himself, which he's done. And, geez, hasn't that paid off for the club? Been enormous. 222 appearances. Yeah. It's been a 191 try. That's pretty close to a try game. Yeah, he, he'll, he'll get it. Well, and Billy, he's, tw- Billy, he's Billy 29. Played 300. He's not yeah. even 30 yet. But Billy played yeah. 300 games. You'd expect him to. Man, what? so he'll 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 go past he'll go past that. Um, we thought it was a feat when he passed Trent Merrin, yeah, as South Sydney's top try scorer. And now he's become one of the greatest in the game, and he's only got one in front of him with you know, twenty tries to go. You know, you'd think he'd he'd go close if not get it. Shout out Alex Johnson. Yeah, keep doing your thing, bruv. Uh, move along to Tigers versus Titans, and at Leichhardt Oval that we talked about, uh, yep. and few. They have finally snapped their... They didn't get a double digits uh, losing streak, the Tigers, by winning 18-10 over the Titans. Wow. They, yeah, they needed this one. Um, with all the pressure, the game the game losses adding up, the media on recruitment, people leaving, people not leaving, people wanting to leave, um, them shift, sh- shipping guys on. Um, they needed this one. And I think they've had two big wins at Leichhardt now. Um, you know, the fans... You know, and I think I heard Benji saying, you know, for for how they've been going and how many losses they've had, the fans have still turned up. They still turned up at Leichhardt Oval to watch them, watch their team play. Um, and they, they needed this one. Great win from them. And I think, you know, the Titans were disappointing. And I listened again uh, to both Karen and Desi Hasler speak. I think we went for a minute 50. Um, both of them were, I, I think they were, Besides saying they were disappointed and poor in their performances, pretty much as sums up what the game was. Standouts for me, Keanu Kinney. Um, mm. Man, that kid can play. I know that obviously when guys come back, he'll make sure we get out of that position, but he is a, a fullback similar to Tane to Opiki. They're, they're two fullbacks that are just sitting in and around NRL's, NRL squads and can play if needed at any other club. but. He was dynamic with his runs, his carries, he's hard to handle, he's fast. He's got nice soft hands too, but, you know, he can break a line. So, you know, some some shining lights, some shining lights for the for the Titans, but a poor performance after, obviously, getting a good win the week before and going there and, and putting in that performance. So um, they'll be disappointed. And, like, again, now they're, they're sitting on the bottom of the table. And if you look at the Tigers and you compare them to the Titans, I don't think the Titans has been as bad as the Tigers, but they find, now find themselves on the bottom of the table and after a disappointing performance for sure. They had chances. They had chances, the Titans, to rescue us. They just didn't convert enough of those chances, especially first half, mm. to really put them away. When you've got a team that's low on confidence and down on form, you've got to go for the jugular straight away and put it straight on them. But... They didn't do that, so at half time, the, the Tigers were in this and they're growing in confidence. And sure enough, they had to try a few things, putting Uppy in the halves. You know, it was was a question everybody was wondering, well, what's Benji thinking here? But you know, it was a master stroke, especially when he had done enough to get him around the park, put him in a position, jumps back into hooker, little grubber kick sets up the try. But I thought the standout for them was Aiden Caesar. 
Yeah, Jaden Caesar was, was enormous. Coming back, just experienced the old head, kicked a 40-20, just got him around the park. Knew when to play the right plays at the right time. Had a, had a great back rower, performing well in Samuel Afainu, mm. outside of him. He's uh, been threatening all season. Yeah. Come up with some brain farts as well, but had his best game for the year um, this, this weekend. And, yeah, that, it was a much-needed win at home. We've spoken about Leichhardt and the, and the crowd and on the on the hills just enjoying themselves. Nothing better for them than seeing their side win and, and doing it well and, you know, in, in trying times. Uh, Stefano as well. He uh, he had a pretty big game. Yep. 57 mm. minutes, 200 metres. That's pretty good. Um, but, oh. Yeah, well, he's a, he's a young talent. Everyone knows that he's got some some great qualities as, as a young front rower and... I guess the, the biggest thing from him is he's not at the top of his career yet. He's still learning his craft, and you're going to get these 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 games from from him uh, where he plays really well, but then you're going to get some inconsistency with his performances. And I guess you know people can see the upside to him, but he's not right there where it is at the moment. But again, he's a big part of uh, the West Tigers, and fingers crossed they don't lose him because he's he's again 206 meters, like oh two 200 meters. You make and you need someone that's going to play big minutes that can run over the top of people that can create those momentums and he's a big part of what the Tigers are doing and need to continue doing 31 tackles zero misses yeah, as well yeah that was a good battle him and Mo Fortuaka yeah it was yeah, a good battle Mo between Fortuaka. the two of them yeah. can you guys talk about the um, the importance of that kind of win for a young kid like Lockie Galvin obviously he was tossing up his decision to stay with the Tigers and you know that must have been pretty heartening for him to be able to see them actually pull out a victory and kind of solidify his decision to stay with the club? Yeah, heartening for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> would, would have been heartening for everyone. I think his decision to backflip on wanting to leave was made before the result. Mm. But, yeah, that definitely gives him some heart and answers a, a few questions for his mum and dad You know, when they're going in to see Shane Richardson mm. and asking the questions about the direction of the club. Mm. They've got the ability... They've got the ability to to pull out wins like this. They just need him on the field to help them do it more often. Yeah, I think like Aiden Caesar, like you said, Willie. I think he can help Lockie Galvin be the best player that he can be because he's got that leadership qualities around him. He can kick them around the field and let Lockie do his stuff that he was doing early in the season. So important that they have someone like Aiden Caesar around to help guide. Lockie, and I'm yeah. guessing, you know, Lockie's most probably felt his most comfortable when he was playing with them. So, although he's injured, get him back out on the field, being able to, you know, help him develop into the player. And then if he stays on there, Jerome Luai comes in and then it's Jerome Luai's chance to guide the team, but also help Lockie get to his best as well. So, a couple of good mentors, one yeah. mentor now and another, obviously you got Benji Marshall, who was a half as well. So he's got two good mentors there right now. He's going to have another one come come next year I think you know he's in the he's in the right position I think yeah. he's going through some hard times it must be hard as a young kid that you, you just come into grade and you've got to stick through those tough times because it's going to make him better for all but you know a couple of good mentors around I'll be leaning on those guys for sure just to guide yourself into you know how I can be the best I can yep. even week mm. or getting real clear clarity and detail around your job and learning, learning about his game yeah. learning about himself mm. and what sort of player he wants to be and how he's going to be, what he's going to develop into. Uh, one of our first videos on the channel was uh, talking about, you know, Willison and Ben, mm. ben Takura uh, when he made his debut earlier in the season. Uh, the Tigers had their own big boy. I know you know, you know like a big boy, Adam, eh? <laughs> Jordan Miller, he's a big love, boy. Love some, love some big bodies. I think this is where I feel like this is where the game is heading. I think if you can get a couple of those different body shapes – um, it gives a different target level for defensive tackles, you know what I mean? So if you have a couple of tall guys, you have some little uh, Mofotoika size guys, you know, they, it, it actually makes the decision defensively a lot harder to read on these guys. So you tackle those those big boys low, they're going to get offloads every time. Xavier Willison, we've seen what he did with the Broncos and made that massive ass break and legs tackle, could have got the ball away, didn't, or he did and then knocked it on, but... They are a big part of where the game is going now. If, as long as they can move laterally well, um, then then they're going to keep um, playing in the game. And I've seen some big kids um, lately, some 17, 18-year-olds that are much of the same size as those those boys. And, man, they're going to be the new thing, I think, when it comes to the game. 
Yeah, well, he he's just come in. Obviously, first game he played 19 minutes. He's the heaviest player in the NRL now. It, 131, 131 kilos. 131 kg. That, 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 is, that is big. He, he may need to drop that down yeah. a little bit. Um, the only other person that I know that can carry that weight really well, I don't think he's 131, is Adam Fanor Blake. But we know he's, what he can do. Um, so they've just got, I most probably, it's understanding what works for him as a player and what's going to be the best playing way to get him at so that he can still have the impact that he has, still be fast but can move laterally because 131 kilos is a lot of lot of weight to be moving sideways consistently in, in the game of rugby league. Seven more kgs than the second heaviest in the NRL, which is Wurumu Greg for the Eels. And then after that, everyone's like, the, they're all touching in the same weight. So he's yeah. a lot. At the top. That's why I had to bring up because I know you like the big boys. Yeah, yeah I think they're, like, they're the way to go. <laughs> yeah, there's some uh, big freaks at the moment. Payne Haas is probably the standout. Mm. Someone who's massive in stature and size but can run fast and, and run for a long yeah. time mm. Yeah, and move. We're just getting more and more of that. He's he set the standard almost saying it's okay to be this way. Yeah. This, is, this is where you have to be now. Well, him and Adam, I reckon, together yeah. have gone, hey – they're showing everyone that you can still be this way, but this is the standard that you have to be at. Yep. So when you're selecting and you're looking and IDing talent, yes, you can have this big guy, but if they can't move well on the field, there's no point in doing anything with no. them. But those guys, yeah, Payne Haas and, and Adam, have, have set the standard for front rowers and been able to carry their weight well. And crazy to think that there's more and more of those types of athletes <laughs> coming through. Uh, next game, the one that obviously all our fans will be wanting to hear about the most, uh, the Warriors versus the Storm at Go Media, 38-24 to the Storm. Just go straight into it, Adam. They'll be just fast-forwarding it to go into yeah. their little spot, so all our fans, hey, guys, see you. I see you here. I see you here. You've made it. you made it early. You didn't have to sit through all of this stuff, but you're here now. Um, yeah, disappointed. Oh, you know, I was disappointed in, in um, the results. Um, I think the hardest thing for me to watch was, and I think the conversation was already, how does Sean Johnson fit into what's already been happening? I don't think that worked. And I think it's going to take time. Um, so I think, you know, the consistency that the two halves between Chanel and Tamati had earlier, I think they're quite similar players, those two young boys. They just play what they see and they play what they feel and they're, they're footballers. I think Sean's gone into you know, more of a structured role. And I just don't think it fit, it, fit the other night into what Tamari was doing. I think there were, you know, I think there was a juggle between who's kicking now and who's going to kick. Is Tamari kicking? Is Sean going to kick? It's So I think they'll be better for the run. Um, I thought, you know, they come out of the blocks 14 minutes into the game and off you know, 20 minutes into the game and they're 14 nil up. But you can never write the Melbourne Storm off. They, they were poor the first 14 minutes. Uh, first 20, sorry, um, and they were like 2-1 completed set, heaps of errors, uh, sitting on their try line, but the momentum was Ali Katoa. His, his, they, they managed to get down the field, kick up high, catch a ball, rips it out of Adam Pompey's hand and then score a try. So um, that was the momentum swing for me, and after that they just went on to just being nice and, and Melbourne Storm. They played the way that they normally play. Jerome Hughes, once he gets into the game, once he starts controlling the game, once he starts running, once he starts making some decisions with his passes and his kicking game, he's enormous. I do think Jerome Hughes is um, faking a couple of his um, <laughs> falling over ones. So I think, um, and this this is where the game's gone though. You know what I mean? So so kickers now are leaving the ground because they know they can't get touched. So if you're close enough to him, that's what's going to happen. I think the same thing with Ali Katoa when he went through. Like Ali. I think Tamari's leg was out, so Ellie yeah. hits his leg and it makes it look worse yeah. than what it was. But he still had contact with the half and they're trying to protect it. So, again, we talk about the grey areas in the game. These are some of them as well. But, you know, Jerome Hughes is, was playing up to a few of those, I think. But he has a different kicking style, I think, to a lot of people. Keeps his head down, kicks up high and just lets, gets off the ground a lot of times if there's pressure coming towards him because he knows you can't be touched. I think the, the most of the halves need to start adapting to what are those those things, but a poor performance I thought from from the Warriors. They'll be disappointed because they they scored twenty four points. So you know Melbourne haven't been really sound defensively. Uh, when the Warriors played their shape, they looked good. 
just wasn't consistent enough and um, weren't disciplined enough to hold out, you know, the Melbourne Storm because they were a good side. Yeah, they were just way off to start the game, Melbourne. And I thought uh, I wasn't surprised in the outcome. Mm. I picked Melbourne to win this one. Uh, so I'm not surprised at the end scoreline. I am surprised, however, in the manner that Melbourne got to that scoreline. With all the ball that the Warriors had at the start of the game and then to only be 14 points up, I thought they missed a couple of tricks. And they missed a couple of opportunities. And surprise uh, was Sean coming back on that uh, three of their tries at least were scored down that left-hand side. Yeah. You know, they found the joy down that end through to Mighty. But uh, they may have some work to do on that right edge because there's that right edge to start with. They played a lot of football together last year. So there's an understanding, but maybe the halves together need to do some yeah. work and get some time under each other's belts and get some reps together to get that going. But yeah, once Jerome Hughes got the ball, and you said this in commentary, Blairy, give them the opportunity, they could be dangerous here. You can never count the Melbourne Storm off, and sure enough, they only had two opportunities down the, the Warriors' end. One of those, Cartor got up. Both of them were from kicks. They competed. One, Cartor strips it out of Pompey. The other one, they pop it back and score in the corner to make it 14. Then Jerome Hughes just comes up with a piece of magic to throw a tunnel ball down the right-hand side and they score to take the lead. And they were just back in it. They were rolling then. They were confident. And you could, whilst I wasn't at the game, you could hear it in the crowd, just the live mm. sort of went out of them. Mm. And that's such an important thing for the Warriors, the, the crowd. When things are going their way and the running's going forward, they're up and the drums are beating and the the, the the Warriors lift from it, but same, it deflated them, just taken over, but they needed to stay with it for a bit longer. But yeah, Jerome Hughes was outstanding for them. He put Cartor away for a fantastic mm. break when he set up Nick Meany. Um, every time he touched the ball, he was dangerous. He set up so far long or later in the game with just running across the field and playing deep into the line. One thing I learned about Jerome Hughes, and I'll look at it more closely, what he does very well, and this is for kickers on last play, when he catches the ball, he doesn't just sit and kick the ball. He, he reads where the mm. defensive line is. So if the defensive line is 10 metres away, he'll, he'll run another meters. six or seven metres, yeah. which tacks on to the end of his kick. Mm. So that's more distance for him, whereas a lot of kickers just catch the ball and kick it, yeah. regardless of where the defenders yeah. are. But he's very, very smart. He knows he's got more room to take up yeah. and, and kick the ball. Well, the other option on that is if, if they're not coming up and he sees a space, he runs it. Yep. So are these, these are the good things that good halves do is you play what you see in front of you. Yes, your first your first idea is to kick the ball into the corner because that's what you want to do. But if no one's coming up, you just take the metres and 100%. kick the ball. And he, he's, he's real good at playing what he sees and... He's got a great kicking game. He goes nice and high. Gives the the, the opportunity for the, the players to get underneath and compete. And um, you know he's he always seems again he's he's most probably the most underrated half in the competition. You don't hear too much accolades about about what he does, but you know when you play the Melbourne Storm, he's a big part of what they do and how they win games. Um, they are they don't have too many notable players out there at the minute, but managing to get guys over the line and turn them into first grade. Trent Liero, like, just gets through his business. Ali Katoa, like, he's Sean been... Moore. He's, yeah, Sean Brawl, like, he was playing reserve grade uh, during the start of the year. I think, you know, our Warriors, New South Wales yep. Cup team played against him. But he's managed to come in there, get confident in himself, get confident in his ability and play the way he's doing. You know, Nick Meaning's been outstanding. His kicking game is huge. His goal kicking is massive. Um, so they just turn over players and turn them into quality first graders. And even when times are tough, you just know the Melbourne Storm that if you don't turn up for the 80, that they're going to manage to get a win in the end. So, you know, I thought that many, there was a few opportunities out wide for the Warriors. They stripped them both sides. But again, they just had to get a little bit deeper and just try and work it out because they, they created opportunities, like you said, but just couldn't execute. Hence why Chance, when he did that flick pass, if the ball was out in front of him, he would have just caught and catch yeah. and pass, scored and trot him. It would have been a simpler way of doing it. But because the ball was behind him, he had to flick a run. Skills, yes, skills a nice try, but I think that's where they lacked a little bit on the edges. When, when they did strip him, it was the execution, whether it was the pass or the decision to really, really understand who's coming and going forward. So, yeah, it wasn't a, um, you know, although the fans turned up and, um, you know, love all the, the passionate Warriors supporters and the chants. Yes, there was in and out of, like, dull times and quiet. It was windy, it was wet. 
Uh, but the, the fans turned up in their numbers, and it's great. Um, I like Sofa Longo. Um, and I said in commentary, like, there's, there's not too many times you can keep this guy out of the action. And, you know, a couple of tries that he scored, his last one in particular. You know, I know the game was, was over by then, but it wasn't for the Melbourne Storm. They played the 80, they went bang, off his right foot. Looks like they're all cornering to the inside. And then he just goes bang, right foot, straight underneath the try. And his dive, I reckon he winded himself, eh? Hey, oh, <laughs> and he nearly dived. I'm say. He nearly dived over the line. Oh. That's how high he got. But yeah, I reckon he nearly learn, he learn winded himself. One. I saw him have to get a chat to me. He tried to say it was his shoulder. Yeah. I know he must probably hurt his shoulder at the same time. You can as just well. imagine. But as soon wow. as he landed, it would have been a. <laughs> yeah, bro. Straight that away. Would have been crack uh, up. A couple of brain fart moments for me from the Warriors. Um, Montoya. Just lack of discipline yep. to try and yeah. tackle an opponent in, on a tap when you're not back 10. It was just a professional foul, out and out. He just needed to go another metre or two. Yeah, he wasn't too far off. And, and let him run at him and then make the tackle. But to do that in an important time was a poor decision to get your team down to 12. And then, obviously, Dallin come up with his head-eye tackle. But mm. I'll go back to that play whilst we don't have the footage here. Um it was a three on two down a short side and Dylan Walker was at mark and I thought Harry Grant did a really smart job to get out short side and square up Dylan Walker and hold the marker from being able to release yeah. and help the two defenders. And once he passed, the three on two came into play. Dylan had, um, Dallin had no choice but to try and come and read. He did the right thing by the read, but the fact that he swung his arm and got him round, he... Yeah, it was just a poor situation for the Warriors to get their winger in trouble to make that. And, you know, he needed to, again, we spoke about Joseph Swali'i, your tackle technique. When you're coming into fly, you've got to get it right. Joey Manu had one in the Roosters game where you got it right, you've got to come in. Yeah, you may be late, but you've got to get it low, a bit like Jordan Ricky. But, yeah, to have two players in the sin bin, both of them off at the same time for about a minute or two, it's just, yeah, you can't do that against a team like Melbourne. Well, when, De when Dallin went off, I think Harry Grant went down the short side twice and then they put a kick through. Yeah. Um, they had one defender down Dylan there on, on three. Yeah, you know what I mean? So smart play from oh, Harry yeah. Grant. Uh, uh, you know, world-class nine. You know, you know that everyone's going to be trying to look for the long side and he just comes down a short side and doesn't even pass it. He goes for a kick yeah. this time and puts a little kick in behind. So, you know, hey, that, that team just keeps turning over, they're sitting at the top of the competition and I don't think they're playing their best footy. They played a tough brand of football against the Warriors because they had to, um, but they put the pressure on themselves for that first 20 minutes. But I don't think they're at their best at their best shed, it's, and, but they're still managing to get these wins, which is important. Um, so, yeah, disappointing night for the Warriors. They're going to have to back it up now and go up against a, a, a Titans team on the bottom of the table and doesn't matter where they are. They lost to them last time, and Titans gave them a bit of a reality check as well. So big game coming up for the Warriors. Do you reckon Storm are top two favourites with the Panthers for the end of the season? Well, they're, they're so consistent with their performance. There's 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 not much of a difference from their bad to their, their best performance, and that's, that's the difference between the best teams, between Penrith and, and the Melbourne Storm, is, you know, they... They are their their losses are so close, or their bad performances, and it's not normally the team. It's some sometimes it's just an individual, um, but they are yeah that right up there with Penrith Panthers at the moment, and they're still missing a few players. They're the two most methodical, clinical, and professional teams out there at the moment. They stick to what they do. They're disciplined, and how they execute. Now yeah, Melbourne come up with some errors, but they don't lose track of what their their jobs are. You know, they just keep getting through it. Larry's talking about the blokes that come in. They come into the squad and they excel and they shine by just doing their jobs and doing it really, really well. Both teams are the same. It was a, it was a big game for Melbourne as well, and I know it's a big game for the Warriors, but they play for a trophy called the McMore Trophy, which is, man, they hold that trophy so dear and close to their hearts. It was the old football manager that used to, back in the day before I went there, he died here in Auckland and so they play for that every time that they play against each other and they obviously had all the old boys yes if you would have saw me touching hands too um, I am an old boy um, I do sit on both sides um, I like it 
Um, but it was the first time they've come over to New Zealand, the old boys, which was nice to see a lot of these old old faces and and some legends of the Melbourne Storm and who started Melbourne a long time ago back in the days. But they all went down to the Viaduct, both t the, both the players and the old boys, and they did this memorial service, and it was great. I just think you know they they're so ingrained in their culture that they do things as one. Um, it's great to see they had all they had all the owners, had the family there, the players turned up. So I think they do a really great thing when it comes to, and I guess it's just I guess and I go back to my time there, just this is what the culture is yep. down in Melbourne Storm. They they look after each other as they, they're one of their own. And, you know, I haven't played down at the Storm since 2011, but we are still, you know, as old boys, we are still connected in some way. And um, it's great to see all these old faces over there, but also the culture that they create um, and how much passion they have behind what this trophy means to the Storm. So... You know, Warriors are always up against it when they play um, the Storm, and it's been what sixteen losses now, consecutively, consecutively against the the Storm. They haven't been able to beat them. Oh, God, that was two thousand and fifteen, I think, or sixteen, last time. time. Yeah. Right. So you know, it's a, it's a tough team to beat. That was a beautiful speech you just made about old boys. I wish my one for the sacred old boys. <laughs> <been that> good, <laughs> but, but you know, uh, moving on to the next game. Eels versus Roosters at Combank, and the Eels not quite the same bounce back that the Rabbitohs have been having. Uh, they've lost it, lost their second game with uh, Mitch Moses and Gutho back. 28-18, Roosters. Yeah, Roosters are still... I, yeah. I reckon Roosters are probably the, the third team outside of the Storm and Panthers uh, because I don't think they played that good, but they yeah. still won. Well, I think, that's the same. I think that's been the Roosters this far this year. I think... Their performance are up and down, um, but they still are finding ways to win. But some of these teams that they've played, they should have won. And there's been games in the been games in the past that they've they've played, and you know they just haven't performed to the best, and they'll be disappointed in the efforts. And this game was a tough game. Um, you know, we the Eels are on on the rise and having you know Clint Guffson back and Mitch Moses, and obviously Origin talks around there for Mitch. So it was a game that. You know, Mitch needed to stand up and, and and try and get them over the line. It was back and forwards throughout that game, um, but I just you know it's it's a hard one for me with both the way they're performing. I think I can't you can't judge on what Roosters team's gonna turn up, and I think if you're a betting man and you go through you know weekly, I don't know if I guess I would have went for the Roosters against the Eels in this one, but there's most weeks there you, you're thinking you know make it's a harder decision, but. You know, obviously, Joey Manu's out there. You've got you know some some quality players through the Roosters, but haven't seemed to be able to fire a shot. Tedesco, I don't know if he was still playing for his position um, because they may have already wanted Edwards back in there. I just don't think they've they're playing to the caliber of what they need to be with the players that they have. I think you go through their team, and I think I've said this before. They are a a, a, a team that can challenge. For, for the trophy at the end of the year they can if they have them all together and they're playing really well so I just don't think they're at their best but managing to get wins there's no doubt in their quality and their ability the Roosters on their day they're mm. the best attacking team in the comp hands down no one attacks like them I've said this before it's defence that they've got to fix up but now added as consistency to that attack because it's yeah they were missing a couple but they can't just keep going to Joey Manu or to Desco yeah. and hoping that something comes off you can't do that every single week those blokes can't come up with it every single week they've got to get the unity right and get the threats across the park and um, I really liked when Kiri got a charge down I'm, I'm a fan of that and he ended up getting the ball because I, I feel like that's a a play we're losing out of the game because of the rules. I thought Jennings was outstanding to start yep. the game. Been very, very good. Shame that he hurt his hamstring. Hamstring, yep. But in doing so, we saw another threat from Angus Crichton moving out to centre. He was very, very good again. I don't think he'll, he'll be dangerous if he carries this form over to New South Wales in game two. He was uh, probably one of the best on the field. Um, spoken about some of this play before, um, Newcastle did it early in the year where the big fellas tipped on to each other. Uh, Junior yeah. Bolo, just a nice little tip on yeah. to Regan Campbell-Gillard. 
boom, straight through. People don't expect yeah. it anymore. I like People it. just think that the big fella's going to truck it up. Yeah. He just skips out to his right of touch, beats the defender with a pass. Front row, Regan Campbell-Gillard, 50 out. Too far for me. I need some support. <laughs> pass it back face. on the inside. Yeah, yeah, he almost didn't know what yeah, to do. he was going. And there's, there's an element here. The front rowers, because they don't come up with it enough, yeah. I don't think they practice it enough. So mm. when they get in those situations, they can't execute it with the confidence necessary. So Willison, yeah. he made that break. If he practices that, he gets the money, the ball or the money, and Broncos score. Yeah. But because he throws it hard, um, Ezra Mahm's got to try and reach back, and they lose the opportunity. Ezra Mahm loses the ball. Big, big play for front rowers, that pass play. Big, big play yeah. for them to practice because it, it yields rewards for them. And I've been in those positions before, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Toy Harris is, and you know what Toy Harris can do with the ball. And I always know that, just expect the ball off Toy Harris. I've been gone through a hole and gone, holy heck, I'm right through. What do I do next? <laughs> you know, and because you don't expect to be running in that much space as a front rower. You know, back row a little bit different because you're running lines. But I think as a front rower, you get a little bit nervous when you're running there because you think, oh, what do I do here? Because I know I don't have the speed to beat the fullback. So the, the, the decision you have to make is, is a, a tough decision. If you pass here, you pass left, you pass right, you got the fullback in and do I beat him? So your mind is just racing, eh? And you just yeah. like, I need to make the right decision. Decision, sorry, decision. And sometimes it's the wrong one. And, and most of the best ones sometimes, unless it's a clear open, it's just to get tackled off the yeah. ball. But like you said, I, and I think... I know, obviously, we've spoken about Parramatta and how oh, well, they are an attacking team anyway, and I don't know too many times that they've always gone through the ball, and I'm sure that they practice a lot of those tip-ons because those are a couple of boys that do pass the ball a lot as well. But, you know, it's great to see big boys in, in, in the middle of the field in space. But again, like you said, is when you're in space, you still got to execute that pass as well. It makes me think about... Uh... Katoa, when he made the break against the Warriors, yes. and as soon as he's gone through, he's almost, hurry up, Nick Meany, hurry yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. You better, you're almost slowing up. Yeah. But, but yeah, if yeah. worst comes to worst, you take the tackle. I've done it, I've done it. That a Don't couple of times you. when I was playing back row down in Melbourne, just got through. I was like, oh, I'm not going to run. Billy Slater, where are you? Yeah. Then just chucked it up to Billy, eh? He got the speed, not me. Um, Kelma Tuilangi just broke into the Eels' starting mm, uh, back, back row, row yeah. spot for the past three weeks, and he's been doing a job there. <laughs> Hasn't but, he? Man, did he have a bit of a brain explosion on that tackle on Lindsay Collins. Yeah, dangerous. He's gonna, he's, he'll gonna. he be on the sidelines, definitely. Um, yeah, it was a bad one. Doesn't it was look a, good. It was a bad one the way Collins landed. Yeah. He, you can see what he's trying to do. He's trying to drive mm. through, but the fact that he lifted the leg to get Collins off balance and past that horizontal and then... Ended up driving them in. Well, well, that's what they're trying to stop, the yeah. lifting of the leg too. That's the, new, so. the new interpretation of the rules. As soon as you lift the leg, the refs are going to penalise you because you don't want to get them into that sort of dangerous position because once you take a leg from underneath them, they've got no control on on who's, you know, when you're carrying the ball. So, And it becomes dangerous. You lift the leg up, you get him past horizontal, you land him on his head, then... Could be the worst case scenario for someone, but obviously hasn't done it on purpose. I don't no, think. No, no one ever does anything on purpose out on the field. That, that's the thing is, you just get caught in. Uh, you know, it's a high pressure game. The environments, you know, there's everything going on. You try and make a tackle. You want to try and win the tackle. Sometimes you grab a leg and you put them in the wrong position and. They're always apologetic because you don't go out there to hurt anyone. The same with every single tackle. I think the Jordan Ricky one as yep. well. He made a, a split decision to make that tackle. If he lowers his target, nothing happens. But he hit him high. So Ali, same thing. He didn't go out there to try and hurt him. He he just yep. got he just got the tackle technique wrong. Like tackle lower. Yeah, and Jared had one in this game. Jared what Hargraves had one, you know, just I thought he made contact with his chest. Mm. But the fact that he didn't lower his mm. his height and didn't bend his back, that's the referee saying, well, you, you didn't try and lower your tackle target, so you've made contact with the head. So, yeah, that wasn't on purpose because the players understand the consequences yeah. if yeah. you do. Nobody wants to spend 10 minutes and put your team under the pump. Sweet. We'll move on to uh, the Sunday games. First up, Sea Eagles versus the Dragons at Four Pines. 30 to 14 to the Seagulls. And kind of like the, what you said about the Roosters and their inconsistency, I feel like the Seagulls are sort of the same because they're mm. a pretty gun team. But there was one play, um, the one where they broke it down the left side and there was about four or five offloads. Everyone was yeah. touching the ball. They went 
half the field down through traffic, which felt like that is what the Seagulls are, but yeah. they just don't always hit it. But this game, they were pretty on. Yeah, with with the way DCE is controlling the game and the way he's playing, he's only getting better. We spoke about, you know, he's obviously getting a little bit older, but doesn't look like slowing down. He's kind of like the Cameron Smith when Cameron Smith was getting older. He was just getting better with his age. And I think DCE is doing the same thing. hamoli has been a massive target for him. Um, between those two, they are, they are dynamic. He is so strong and so powerful with his runs. Um, it actually helps DC be able to just show and go and do his thing as well because he uses them up on that drop off a lot, uh, and then when he gets them out wide, he can he can beat players just by just running over the top of them. And I kind of think we saw that in the um, the Origin as well when he got his opportunity. When he's running lines, you actually have to stay square on him. He actually makes you make decisions defensively. So he's been a big part of uh, you know what the. The Manly Seagulls are doing. Yes, like you said, they have been inconsistent, inconsistent with their performances, but I think they are a, they are a team that can challenge at the end of the at the end of the year as well. You got to give them credit because I think the Dragons come out, put it on them, and then they ended up playing with literally what twelve men on thirteen, what, thirteen men on no the, subs left, no for subs the whole left. You know, there has some HIs and their guys go down. Um, so that was uh, most probably their toughest win. If, if you think about the situations that we're in, up against a uh, I get up against a Dragon team with some star strike power all over the field. They just didn't step up to the mark against the Seagulls. And, you know, they played it obviously at home for Pines. You know, it's always exciting to play at home. And I managed to get a win in front of their, in front of their fans. You'd think with a team down to the bare 13, no subs left for the second half, that they'd fatigue and fall off. It's quite the opposite. I thought they got mm. more energetic as the, as the game finished. And it was a game where... Both halfbacks really stood out and stood up for their teams. Both Queensland halfbacks. <laughs> know what I mean? <laughs> I thought uh, Hunt was outstanding for his team, kicking 40-20s, but uh, I thought he was just pipped by uh, Daly Cherry Evans. Some of his pass plays, pass options, executions, getting Homole Olukoyatu out there, Levi, Lehi Opoati, outstanding mm. at the back. He's going to be one for the future. Yeah. Quick. Can run the kid, um, but some of his kicking he set up Jake Trebojevic, and then his kick on the last play out to the right after they've made the break to understand that the Dragons were short and were going to fly up, and then just put a nice soft touch in behind. Just a smart, smart footballer. And as this Blair said, and like Cooper Cronk, he's just getting better and better and better. And I wouldn't be surprised, like like Ben Hunt, that they're playing. You know, yeah. into their latter years, the way they the way that they're going, and people are asking them the question, "How long is he going to play Origin?" Well, if he's still playing on form, and keep going, hundred percent, keep playing. Yeah, Lehigh Hopwade, like you just said, man, he was good. And I think you said uh, also in previous games, Kinney and um, yeah, Falongo as well. It was a kind of a week of all the young yeah. fullbacks standing up. Fletcher Sharp in the next game as well. Well, it's it's consistency with playing playing time on the field and on the biggest on the big games and the big stage, you know. And it's hard to build that, I guess, confidence and consistency if you're in and out of the team. Um, but what keeps you in the team is your performances weekly, consistently. So, you know, these guys have grown. I think you know, even Keanu Kinney's grown. He's grown as well. And I think between them all, they you know they're going to be key fullbacks for, for their team. So um, keep them on the field, keep doing their thing, and, you know, you'll get these rewards. Yeah, the first question you get get asked when you come in is, one, can you handle it? Can you do it? Yeah. They've answered that. They all can, all of those guys. How long they, can they do it? How long can they keep going? The, the rigours and the challenges of the NRL is a big week in and week out. That's the big test. Getting to first grade... As, as players will learn, it's the easy thing. Staying there is the hard bit. Being able to get your jersey every single week is the real challenge. Um, there's, um, there's also some rumbles about um, potentially moving Turbo back into the centres. Yeah. Yeah, and keeping Lehigh at fullback because he's yeah. playing so well. Yeah. They like his potential. Well, Any I thoughts th on that yeah. move? Well, I think it's more the, the running that you have to do at fullback, eh? Because I think Clint Gutherson will end up moving somewhere closer to, I think, in the end. Because they, I guess the the fullback position, you you know, it's made for our younger fullbacks now. I think it's you've got to cover a lot of meters. Yes, 
you know, Turbo's really good at what he does, but his hamstring issues are, are saying, are telling telling them a different story. Mm. You know, less will be less running in in the centres, but he can still be effective in the game. You've got these young guys coming through, Lehigh Hopwadi coming through, that can do do a job at fullback and have some trust in what he can do. You get Turbo back into the team, less are running, still good quality. I think that's, that's where it'll end up going, I think, for him. Yeah, totally agree. It's all about the loading. The loading on his body, not just game time, it's every single day. Yeah. The fullbacks do a lot of metres throughout the week, especially when it comes to game time, especially someone like him. Mm. And his stride pattern when he's in open spaces is long. Um, changes a little bit when you're in the front line and you've got to use a bit more footwork to beat defenders unless you get in the clear and in the open. But, yeah, I think it, it's a smart move if they do do that to preserve his career and get some longevity and get as much out of him as possible. I think it's a really smart move for them to get him out of the, the fullback position and still get some quality. He's shown that at state of origin level what level when he's played in the centres. He can still do it and still do it to a high level. Who do you guys think would be the casualty in the back line? Because obviously they've got um, Jason Saab, Garrick, Kohler and uh, Tommy Talau now in form. Who would who would drop out for if that was the case? Well, I think if you if you look at um, you know injuries, and that's how I think he comes. Like he'll 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 find his way back into there. It'll be a, a performance, a bad couple of bad performances from someone before he falls in there. I think like you've got to have him in the team somewhere. Unfortunately, rugby league, someone misses out or someone has to get moved away for Tom Zavoyevich because we know what he can do. So I don't know who will end up going out um, because Garrick is a kicker. Uh, Saab has got speed to burn, but I don't think the other two boys have done anything wrong. I think if you look at the Warriors side, it would have been the same thing about Roger Tulvasa-Shek. You know, how does he get back in the team? Well, now they're struggling for centres because two, two have gone down. So that's that's where, um, you know, the game of rugby leagues, you know, one door, you know, closes, another one opens, and you get your opportunity back in there. If um, they were to do that now, mine would be Garrick. They've got Cherry, Cherry. Evans or, yep. or Brooks who can kick goals. Mm-hmm. So they can cover that position. And I think uh, Cole is a, a better athlete, mm. a better runner of the ball, more dangerous. So he, I'd say if they did that and they made that change, on top of that, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Trebojevic has played right centre at origin level. So he'd probably go on that right side and it'd be hard, it'd be tough. But yeah, I think Garrick would be the one to, to go and mm. at the expense of bringing him back in. Yeah, tough in the thing. Uh, last guy I just want to say about Jake Simpkin made his debut at Hooker for the Sea Eagles, and like he didn't really do anything wrong. I think he, I thought he was I thought he was a solid addition for their team because especially Croker has been injured for a while now, and they've kind of been a bit loose in the in that position. Some of the young guys yeah. having a test out and stuff. So if if he is going to be a long term asset, I think decent. Anyway, we're going to do the last game, Knights versus the Panthers. <laughs> Come on, you guys are always silent whenever I'm... Knights versus the Panthers oh, at McDonald Jones, uh, 26-18 to the Panthers. And as much as I love the Panthers, you know I have my other jersey. <laughs> Every time they win a game, there's nothing I can really say except, oh, yeah, the Panthers just won the game. Like... Because that's just what they do usually. Uh, so yeah, uh, Luai. Yep. Again. Yeah. All all Blues players I thought uh, played well, uh, and mostly they're they're like your your main players in that that um, Panthers team. You know, besides obviously Fisher Harris and Moses Lealta and what they create through the middle of the park for them. But if you want anyone to stand up in in these times when Nathan Cleary hasn't been available, Luai and Yo. Have been the key guys that have got them and steered them around the park. I think Luai's played his best. I think he's been the best player I've seen uh, the last six weeks around that six position or seven position because he's, especially with Nathan Cleary being out and what he's been able to create, but the energy that he plays with in that left foot that he always comes off. I'm sure teams talk about how he comes off their left foot all the time, but no one can seem to stop him. He skips around. You know, it was great to see Dylan Edwards back out there, consistently just strong with his carries uh, in everything. He's got some nice try support off Moses Leota through the middle of the park. Um, yeah, I think, you know, if you look at the Penrith team, uh, you know, being able to turn up and put in a strong performance before they lose all their players is a great performance. I think the Knights, 
Yeah, I think they're, they're they're one of those inconsistent teams, but they must be down the the bottom of the you know they they're higher than higher than the Warriors, right around the middle of the park with the Warriors and stuff like that. Everyone's fighting. This is the good thing about the lad at the moment that they, everyone's sort of fighting chance because you know, you don't know who's going to win on the day. I thought you know nice de- debut from a couple of their from their fullback. Thought he was really well scored. Nice try. I like him. Uh, I think he's Pappenhausen like so. Um, but again. You know, Penrith Panthers just do their thing. The thing, I think there's a stat in there about Martin's misses. What is that, seven seven missed tackles? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of alarming, but the way that he plays, he's aggressive. Yeah. Um, so you're going to have those missed tackles. So he comes down that hard and whacks people. They may bounce off a few times, but then the next, the system that the Panthers have is it's like, if, and I think I watched them play the COVID year, the grand final they played up in Suncourt where they just rush the the team and they'll bounce out of one tackle and then the other guy will come and get him. So I think they play a, a style like that where everyone's on the same page. There's a nice straight line. If, if I come up and whack someone, he bounces over there and then the next person gets him and they kind of make, they lose metres because he's so aggressive with it. But, you know, you can't fault his efforts and what he does because he is a tough player and he does everything really well. So, you know, Panthers just... I'm in around that area waiting for opp- opportunities to get their man back and go up another gear. Yeah, they'll be disappointed the Panthers how they started the game, especially Luai, that poor tackle effort on Fletcher Sharp yeah. to yeah. open the scoring, who was almost uh, taking him back to his touch days. He barely got a hand on him. And full credit to Fletcher Sharp. He was, he was, was that, he was sharp as he got through. <laughs> He's a ducker too, eh? He, he was, yeah. duck under He just too. got low and, and his speed him. and footwork yeah. got around Luai to go in and score and open the scoring for for the Knights. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, bitterly disappointed with how they started the game, but they they grind it out, they get themselves back in it and true to form, they just keep giving the ball to Brian Toro. He makes another 200-plus metres, oh. keeps grinding away. Knights... They gave themselves a chance to fight back late on, but uh, an area for concern for the for the Panthers will be defence. Everything's falling on Luai at the moment. That'll be better for them going forward when Cleary comes back. All good halfbacks have time. They have time, and he gets his time when he's doing that left foot step. Yeah. You can see when he went bang, bang, step, and all the while he's assessing the situation and what's happening, and then out of nowhere he just puts the grubber in, they get a drop out. He's just soaking it all up. And like all the good halfbacks, he's assessing the moments and, and the right play to come up with. But on the other side, however, I, I've been impressed with Schneider when he stepped up, but defensively he's got some work to do. He came up with a really bad read for a try to the Knights um, back end of the half. But my play of the game, my play of the day was uh, Big Moses. Big Moses straight <laughs> through the middle, but a left foot step. To beat Sharp, left hand offload, boom, yeah. tried to Edwards, who's always sniffing around for the chance, but he's, yeah, he was great. Moses Liotto on that play just ducked in, right in behind the ruck. Bit of footwork, bit of speed, explosive. You can see how happy he was when he put that try on, and, and deservedly so. He's quick. When Mo, I've seen Moses get into space and score some tries <coughs> too, and I think he actually oh, stepped him. I think he beat him with yeah, the yeah. foot. I think yeah. he got around he them. And I think he could have gone on, but you know, true, um, you know, Moses' spirit, he just gives the ball back inside. But better to be safe than sorry. But he is, a, he is quick. Moses oh, yeah. when he gets into space. He showed that last year in the grand final yeah, when he supported yeah. for that try. Yes, yes, come from nowhere. I think if he weren't at, at Panthers and playing system more, he might be able to do stuff like Hazelton and Adam do. Maybe like he, he you guys was. Yeah, I think he would be. Workers. You know, if they, I guess the system works for what they do, but yeah. like you can imagine. Both him and first Shaharis playing a little bit wider, running at smaller defenders. How many more tries they may have been able to yeah. score? But yeah, Nat Luai was at his best doing his thing. Um, just some news here. I'm looking at the report on the Queensland team. They <coughs> had an interview with Billy Slater, and it seems like Cobo is not a hundred percent. So yeah. he's saying that he reckons that if he had been the Broncos have a buy, but if the Broncos didn't have a buy, they'd probably rest him. So. Knowing yeah. that, I guess you don't want to pick, as you said, with the injury, any clouds above you, you don't want to pick someone with that. Yeah, well, the thing is, a lot of players are must be carrying injuries at the moment. I think the difference from him, he's 22 years old, and, like, he's been a, he's 
he's played some big games and played in a different position. And I think that the most probably the the biggest thing for that is his welfare, making sure that he's his body's right to go for, if not the third one, if not the Broncos. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes I guess you know Billy Slater and Billy we trust him. Guessing he sees something there that most probably was wasn't going to help and, and covered himself by bringing Dan Gag on, who you don't miss out. And you don't need the distractions at this level. In Origin, you don't need the distractions. You saw in Origin 1, Nico Hines was mm. injured all the way through. And is it going to be Kerry? Is Kerry playing for the Roosters? He's been called back into camp and then he plays for the Roosters. So you don't need that carry-on. You don't need any more distractions than what you need. And Bill, Billy doesn't need to answer any more questions than what's in front of him. Yeah. So just prepare the team as best you can. Answer the questions. Let the media do their bit. But don't give them anything to ask, any questions that are yeah. going to distract the players or distract the group. Yeah, he's gone. He's not 100%. We've moved on. Mm. Everyone in camp is 100%. We're ready to go. Well, you, you, you bring it out today and you squash the news on Monday. Yep. And then you can get on with the rest of the, the camp. Clean because slate. There's, there's nothing else to talk about in Queensland camp, is there? There's, <laughs> everyone's fit and healthy and ready to go. So the distraction has already been put out now. What, the question was, you know, why isn't Cobo selected? He's told him. Yep. He's under an injury crowd. Most probably wouldn't play. Now what are they going to talk about? Yep. So giving giving the media nothing to talk about in Queensland camp, there's no distractions. Everyone's fit to train. They'll be training stay tomorrow. Everyone fit, ready to go. And just like how Queensland like things done. Uh, before we head off home, obviously I'm wearing the beanie. It was beanies for brain cancer. Oh, Dills is too. Chuck oh. yourself on, Dills. Oh, get out. Oh, get me on. Look at that. Oh. Look at our two beanies, eh? Nice. Warriors. Warriors, he's a diehard. You Glass. probably can't tell what my one says, but it says Corona. I, 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 just on the beanie, so I'll tell you a quick one. We obviously managed to to ruffle, rustle up one beanie, um, and mate, they are they are hot property. Those those beanies <laughs> are hot property. They are like gold in the game of rugby league right now. Um, you know, awesome to see the NRL support the the brain uh, Mark Hughes Foundation, and I think they raised over three point something million. Three point one mil. Three point one yeah. mil. It's great. I think. Um, you know, it's a great thing that the the rugby and the game, the league, the game can actually support. You know, this 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 opportunity, and it's great that um, everyone goes out there and supports it. And obviously, the fans got involved. But yeah, it is gold these beanies, and I've had that many messages for my one beanie <laughs> saying, "How do I get one of those?" I, I couldn't even get one to be honest, but I found one. I got one. Uh, full congrats to the whole NRL community. That's including everybody in the game. From TV to everyone, because everybody wore them. I saw so some of the camera staff and, yep. in Australia were wearing them. The runners, the message people, the physios, teams wore them when they're out. Coaches, people working on the TV, the interviewers, fans, everybody in every sector of the game had a hat on. And well done for supporting Mark Hughes and his foundation and all the tough work that he's done and, and all the money that he's raised. And congrats to him as well for all the hard work he does. So. Yeah, great work, NRL community and, and rugby league as a game. And we'll do our bit. Uh, we'll chuck a link uh, on the YouTube video as well in case, you know, you missed out over the weekend. But, yeah, that was it for a beautiful another week of rugby league, eh? Beautiful, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, brothers, for Hello, another boys. beautiful episode. Thank you, Farno, for tuning in. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, tell your Farno, tell your friends, tell everyone out there in the world. Happy for our states, uh, our United States, our US people to come in and, and subscribe. Throw it all out there, but thank you very much. Another beautiful episode of Rugby League. Make sure you tune in next week for another one. Let's go.